Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to FCNL's 2021 annual meeting. As we get started in this virtual environment, we're going to ask you, those of you who are watching on YouTube, to share where you're watching from. Tell us uh, who you are and where you're joining us from, and if you're connected to a local meeting, tell us what the meeting is or what other connections you have. We may not be able to meet in person, but at least we can talk to each other over this technology and share what our joys are and what we're looking forward to. And to help with this process, I've got Annie Chirasi, uh, who is at what we're calling YouTube Central. I, I hope, Annie, that you can maybe tell us who's joined so far. Give us a sense of the community of people that are joining us from around the country. Yes, Jim, thank you so much. I am here live at YouTube headquarters. Um, and I have to say, folks have already been introducing themselves in the chat. We have people from all across the country. Susan Penn says hello from Memphis. John Adler is in Spokane, Washington. Eden Grace in Southern Maine. Sarah Avery from Colorado. Uh, we've even got our own Wesley Pinkham in Tacoma, <laughs> Washington, DC. Uh, it's been really great to see all of these greetings come in and we hope that you'll continue to really interact with us on the chat and build community there. All right, well, thank you so much, Annie. Uh, and now we'll get into our main program and I'm just super excited to be able to welcome and introduce Diane Randall, the General Secretary of the Friends Committee on National Legislation who will be uh, providing the opening remarks today for the first general session of our Quaker Public Policy Institute and annual meeting. Diane? Thanks, Jim. Happy to welcome all of you. Uh, Jim and I are both here at FCNL's main office that many of you have visited right on Capitol Hill across from the Hart Senate office building. And while we wish that we were with you together in Washington, D.C. and trudging up to the Capitol and to the legislative office buildings, we found the next best thing, and that is to have over 600 of you joining us from around the country, uh, with over 500 people participating in lobby visits today and tomorrow. And that is really exciting. You have come at the absolute best time. This is a moment. This is a moment when we are poised for making monumentous transformational change in the policies of our country that help families, that help children, and that offer an opportunity to end poverty. And later on, in just a little bit, you'll be hearing from our Director of Domestic Policy, Amelia Keegan, who leads our economic justice portfolio, and you'll be learning a lot more about that lobby visit. Through the next four days, we have a whole range of activity that I know um, many of you will be here for the entire time. Some of you will be coming in and out for various activities, but we welcome you for any part of this next four days that you can join us. You are a vital part of FCNL's network. It is through you that we reach the 435 members of Congress, the 100 senators, and it is your stories and your voices as constituents that they want to hear. And so we thank you for being with us today. So as you know, this legislation that you'll be hearing about, uh, we are making a real priority on the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit. But this is also legislation that has uh, huge investments to address climate change, another critical issue for FCNL's constituents. For some of you, this will be your first meeting with a congressional office. But for many of you, and I dare say probably most of you, you have already begun building relationships with your congressional offices. Whether you're a member of an advocacy team, whether you have been part of FCNL for decades and have uh, gotten to know all the people who represented your district, you've learned with FCNL about how to engage with members of Congress, whether they agree with you on the position that you're taking or whether they vehemently disagree. One of the truths that we have seen in our advocacy is that many members want to meet with FCNL constituents because we not only go in to tell them what we'd like to ask them to do, but we go in to listen. And this listening approach is incredibly important and the capacity to both be persuasive and uh, make an ask, but also to listen to another point of view is vital to how we do our lobbying. 
So I, as I said, uh, when I started out, we have um, many things that are happening in the next four days. Um, in addition to the lot to lobby training, in addition to getting to join together with people from your own state and district and preparing for a lobby visit, uh, I just want to remind you that it's not only what you take in, but it's also what you bring out. And you're going to hear this again and again uh, over the next couple of days is please tell us what happened in those lobby visits. It's really helpful to us as we continue our work on the Hill. And I want to say also that um, it's not only what happens during this time that we lobby together for Build Back Better legislation, but you're building relationships that are going to be important in the year to come and in the years to come. And so do listen carefully and do think about how you can um, uh, build your relationship with your member of Congress or with the, with the staff in that, in that office. So before we go farther, um, Annie, who has been uh, really the prime organizer for this meeting, has done a great job of collecting um, and encouraging advocates across the country, uh, both our staff and in our network, to greet uh, one another. And so we have some videos that we'd like to share with you now, if we can ask those to be teed up. Hello, I'm Adlai Amor, Associate General Secretary for Communications at FCNL. Thank you for attending the annual meeting and thank you for your generosity and your continuing advocacy and support. Greetings from Skipac, Pennsylvania. My name is Deb Hale and I'm a member of Winnet Friends Meeting, part of Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. I'm here at Ott's Exotic Plants where every year they plant this fabulous chrysanthemum mountain for our pleasure. Hi, this is Jim Kaysen, and I work with the Strategic Advocacy Group at FCNL. I am so excited that so many of you are coming to our lobby day and our annual meeting this year. I can't wait to see you. Hello, everybody. I'm Noelle Krugoff. I'm in Tacoma, Washington right now, and I attend Tacoma Friends Meeting. Hi, I'm Jose Santos Was, the Director for Just Reform at the Friends Committee on National Legislation, coming to you live from Charm City, USA, right near the beautiful Baltimore Harbor. Welcome. Hello, FCNL from Pembroke, New Hampshire. That's great. Isn't that fun to see people coming from different parts of the country? That's what uh, this makes this exciting. So uh, let me just give you a slight preview of some of the uh, delights and um, uh, uh, participation that you'll be able to enjoy in the next four days. Um, as a Quaker community, uh, we will have times for worship. We will have times for worship sharing. And um, you'll find the details of the schedule in the book. We'll also have time for affinity groups to break into smaller discussions with people to share our perspectives from ways that we identify ourselves and to reflect on our Friday evening plenary and at other points of time in the, in the um, sessions. You're gonna hear speeches from program assistants, which I know is always a delight for everyone. Um, and this year will be no different. We have a wonderful group of program assistants working with us. You're going to have a chance to talk to the lobbyists who work at FCNL. And I know that's always a highlight because probably everyone on here, while I know you care about all the issues we lobby for, there may be one issue that for you is particularly important, whether it's our Native American work, whether it's climate change, or whether it's peace building. And so you'll have two opportunities to go and hear from our lobbyists. I am really looking forward to hearing from Vanessa July on Friday night. And I hope all of you will be able to join us um, to hear Vanessa speak about uh, her work in both uh, the, the work based on her work at the Friends General Conference in addressing racism and her work in, in considering how we as a, a society of friends and as a society address white supremacy and how we make changes within ourselves. And we're gonna be talking more about that. Shortly, you're gonna be hearing from our assistant clerk about some of the work that FCNL has been undertaking uh, to, to advance diversity, equity, inclusion here at FCNL and how we create a sense of belonging for everyone. It is something we want to do for you in the next four days is have a sense where everyone feels that they belong to this organization. 
As I said to you earlier, uh, I am here in Washington, D.C., and this place is the ancestral land of the Nakachtank tribe. Uh, this is our, our building stands on that ancestral land, as does much of Washington, D.C. And the Nakachtank are also known as Anacostans, indigenous people who lived on the banks of the Anacostia River, including several villages right here on what we now call Capitol Hill and Washington, D.C. In the 1700s, the Nakachtank had merged with other tribes, the Pamunkey and the Piscataway, both of which still are in existence today. So now I'm gonna encourage you to share in the chat the land where you will are joining us from and what that acknowledgement compels you to do. So we're gonna put up in the chat, I think it may be up there already, a place where you can go and look at what the ancestral land is that you are located on. Please include that in the chat. And as we uh, move into our next phase, I wanna ask everyone to join in a period of silent reflection to think about either this ancestral land that we occupy today, or to think about what you are bringing into this meeting uh, as we gather to go forward to um, worship, to uh, come together, and to celebrate the work of FCNL. Thank you. Well, thank you, Diane, for starting us off. Um, I certainly, as I was centering there myself, I was thinking about how fortunate uh, I am to be in a learning community that's uh, as a practice of, of exploring what's the next vision of our community and how we can work together and a, and a way of uh, really just continuing to add uh, from the energy and the excitement and the innovation of so many friends and like-minded people around the country. This, as, as Diane said, we've just had a tremendous turnout already for annual meeting from all over the country. And as, as, as we've said, we want to welcome people, but we also want to represent the different people who are coming together uh, for this gathering. And so we're going to play one more, uh, of those welcome hello videos from people around the country. And then, and then I'm gonna ask Annie to come back on and share a little bit of what's the conversation that we're seeing on the chat. So if we can just uh, enjoy this video. Hi, Grace Gifford here. 
in Conway, South Carolina, lands of the Wakaba people, and a proud member of the South Carolina advocacy team. Hi, my name is Kelsey Schaefer. I'm the senior manager of donor databases at FCNL. This is Ruby Schaefer. We are from Washington, DC, and we are so excited to have you join us this year for annual meeting 2021. Hi, this is Susan Navi. I'm a major gifts officer here with FCNL, and I'm so excited for you to be joining us virtually here in DC for annual meeting this year. Have a fantastic time lobbying, and thank you so much for your advocacy. Hello from the Ida B. Wells statue on Beale Street in Memphis, Tennessee. My name is Susan Penn and I attend Memphis Friends Meeting. Hello, my name is Willie and I live in Washington, D.C. I am an FCNL advocate. Welcome to Annual Meeting 2021. Hey, I'm Barb Brace Pedrotti, the rep from Richmond Friends Meeting, standing here in Richmond in front of what used to be the Lee Monument, but he was removed several weeks ago, so I'm happy to be here. Wow. That was just so much fun. Uh, thank you to all of you who sent videos in to help us get ourselves started here. This is, uh, this, I, 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 as everyone on staff knows, I'm someone who really likes and misses joining each other physically in Washington, D.C. But I do, I am beginning to get this sense of the community of people that have gathered around the country. And uh, Annie, if, if you can, I, I hope you can come back on and tell us a little bit about what you're seeing on the YouTube chat. Tell us a little bit about the community that's coming together. Absolutely. I mean, I just have to quickly shout out Willie, the dog, for sending in a video. That was really something else. And it's we're, we're grateful to have advocates of all shapes and sizes. So, so good to have you. Um, I mean, I really wish you could be in this chat right now, Jim. I hope you'll get some time in it later because friends are posting so many. We really, truly have people from all across the country. And it's really wonderful to see how many people are aware of, you know, the ancestral lands in which in which they um, are currently and just so much love in the chat and so much community building. Uh, it's definitely something that uh, I'm so excited to be a part of over here. I'm going to have to figure out how I can get some time to go look at that chat later for sure. That just sounds uh, both uh, heartwarming and also important as, as we all go through our own journey of recognizing the the land on which we sit today. So uh, really uh, an important part of our practice now that uh, is part of our evolution. Uh, I, you know, I know we didn't do this when I first got to FCNL, and so I'm glad to see how we're living into the world. Um, so what's coming up? I think that's my next job here, uh, is today, as Diane said, we're gonna learn about the issues we're lobbying on and prepare for your visits. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but I'm really looking forward to hearing from Amelia because she's up there on Capitol Hill, walking the halls of Congress virtually now, but still is just in touch with so many different people. Uh, and then uh, really this, these two days are days when we're making you all work because Thursday's focus is on lobbying. And there'll be some other opportunities to gather uh, as your lobbying schedule allow, allows. But as Diane said, a lot of this work is really, if we're going to build the world we seek, then this is the work that we have to do as a community. This is the work that we're called to do. And I often say to friends who participate in the priorities process and to other people is, it's good to set these priorities. Now, let's figure out how we're going to do the advocacy to really make those come through. And then at the end of the day, uh, We'll have some opportunity, I think, if I remember correctly, to do some uh, some uh, worship sharing. And, and then uh, we're also going to hear from uh, our Snyder awardee, Senator Todd Young. Uh, we'll receive the Snyder Award and, and we'll hear some of those speeches from program assistants. I know for me, that's a, that's a super highlight of the day as well. Uh, and I have to tell you, and I, I, I'm not sure this is going to happen, but 
you all are here at such a perfect time that we actually have other outside speakers that are asking for time to talk to you. So we may have a few other people that are coming in uh, later on. Friday uh, is the day that we're going to build our community more and learn at workshops. There'll be some opportunities to meet with FCNL's leadership team uh, and also some opportunities to learn from each other. And then Friday evening is really the keynote address from Vanessa July that uh, Diane referred to earlier that I think is another part of the journey of FCNL as a community, part of our, our own learning. And then Saturday, uh, our general committee gets down to business. We're gonna, we've got decisions to come to unity around, uh, as well as uh, alternative programming for attendees not serving in that committee. And then Saturday evening is something I'm really looking forward to is we'll be celebrating uh, 10 years of Diane's leadership at uh, Saturday's plenary. And, and Diane has reminded me, this is, a, in my mind, this is a celebration of Diane, and it's also a celebration of all that she has helped us accomplish in these 10 years. And then Sunday is our last day of programming at annual meeting. Uh, our business will conclude and we'll have a closing plenary uh, where we'll hear from some more program assistants and, and continue to uh, talk about what is the work in the next year that uh, we're going to be doing. So that's the program. I would be remiss if I didn't also begin this annual meeting by telling you that one of the ways that you support this work is by doing the advocacy that you do. Another thing that is just part of the strength of FCNL is the financial support that you all provide to our organization and our community. And I have to tell you that uh, that is both one of the joys of this community and one of the strengths of this community. FCNL's work is supported by a network of generous individuals across the country, including many of you I know. So I wanna say thank you to begin with. And we're also this year uh, excited to have a goal across the course of the weekend to sign up 25 new monthly donors. You can sign up, and I think Andy's gonna put this in the YouTube chat, or maybe she already has, by going to fcnl.org slash sustainers. But that's the, that's the place where if you are able and you could uh, consider making a monthly gift. Those monthly gifts really uh, are make a huge difference to the organization. To have that regular source of income allows us to do the long-term work that uh, we really can do. You know, as as I think about uh, FCNL's work over the years, one of the comparative advantages we really have as a faith community is that we stay engaged. Diane talked about building relationships over time. I, I won't do this because I know Andy doesn't want me to talk for too long, but uh, I, will, I will just say that I could tell you about bills that we began working on 10 years ago, that it took those 10 years for those bills to pass in Congress, but there are not a lot of groups that actually have the capacity to work on something. And, and this is one of the words from Diane's first talk, I think, uh, to the annual meeting, uh, to work on those issues relentlessly, to, to stay engaged. That's how we do the work that, uh, we, that we need to do. So this is the end of the opening session. We're going to uh, transition now to the, to the next session of the, of the program, where I think I'm going to be joined by Mary Lou Hatcher, uh, who Diane referred to earlier, who is our assistant clerk. Okay, well, welcome back. And now, as I said, we're gonna transition to our own work, seeking an equitable FCNL. And, and I'm just really pleased to, in, to introduce Mary Lou Hatcher, who is the assistant clerk of the general committee and also the convener of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Working Group of the General Committee. So Mary Lou, welcome. Thank you, Jim. 
And um, hello, friends from across the country, and welcome to our 2021 annual meeting, Choose Hope, Work for Justice. As we gather to do our work with both members of Congress and with each other, we want to begin this time with a reflection on our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So when we are in program together throughout this time, these next days on Zoom, I hope that you might pause from time to time and scan the virtual Zoom room. Welcoming each other with your gaze, your open heart and your keen mind because we won't be able to have a handshake. We won't be able to have a cup of coffee in the corner. That's not yet the purview of Zoom. But do take time to hold one another in light, in love, knowing that we share many things in common and that we are all coming into this community from very different places. We do and we don't know each other. And it is in this welcoming of our differences and our DEI commitment to assist and strengthening our community that I wanna to speak to now. So we're gonna begin with the sharing of our statement of DEI. And I hope that as I read some of these words out loud, that you might hear them as a commitment, but also as a prayer. At FCNL, we embrace having a multitude of voices and talents working together to strengthen our impact in the world. We aspire to weave the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion into every aspect of our organization. We invite our staff, committee members, volunteers, and guests to share their diverse backgrounds because those unique perspectives are important contributions to our work. And I might add to our relationships. We actively build our knowledge and skills to be culturally competent colleagues and partners working for a just and peaceful world. And that is the statement friends that we adopted in 2015. We of course want this to go beyond words and you are invited to join together in participating during annual me meeting in engaging actively with our community safety agreement to embody a beloved community, one where all persons are welcomed, every friend and every guest is seen, valued in their full identity, encouraged to work out of their particular lived experience, where no one is held as privileged and patterns of privilege are challenged. You can access the community safety agreement in many of the documents that you've received in the mail and also see online. As we share and, and just focus on that community agreement for a moment, want to highlight a few things and you can read it in its full throughout the weekend, I invite you to do so. I think we were going to have the commitment on the screen, but there we go. Okay, thank you. So friends, we've made a commitment to make things right. We will offer reparation, restitution, and repentance when injuries occur within our work. We bring to this work respect. We bring to the work honesty. We bring to the work non-judgment, exercising the, di the discipline of deep listening, responding in a way that does not diminish the courage of ones that speak honestly. We'll exercise the discipline of listening with the intent to understand another before we respond with our own points of view. We come with the commitment to be supportive and also to be trustworthy. 
We will hold our process together close and deep. We will not hold past wrongs or injuries against each other or spread stories about each other within our community. We will consider how brave space is sacred space, sacred, a sacred lockbox where we protect our trust with one another. We make a commitment to patience. We make a commitment to agape. We value and affirm each other because of the presence of God in one another, not because of the performance, failures, or successes that we exhibit. We come together to share unshockable persistence, recognizing that we have seen a lot and there is still more to be seen. We will engage each other in a way that does not shame, but which exercises persistence. As a way of honoring the humanity in each of us, we commit to not abandoning the process or each other, but our persistence will lead us to say, we're not going away, please say more. We want to move beyond Quaker nice. We want to exercise self-awareness and empathy and curiosity and, and knowing and caring and a commitment to be brave. So I invite you to revisit that community agreement throughout our weekend together. It was adopted I might, and in, um, it was uh, recommended by the executive committee and approved at annual meeting last year in 2020. It's part of our commitment together to grow as a culturally competent community. The work is aspirational and long-term. The damage done throughout the centuries of our nation's history will not be attended to friends in any short or efficient manner, you know that. But tools like the community agreement will forever be a guide, a guide that asks us to return and return and return to the commitment we have made to love one another well. And people from many faith traditions will recognize this spiritual practice, returning to truth, returning to love, return, return, return. To help us with the returning to our community agreement, there are multiple practices in place during annual meeting. Those of you who've been with us in past years know that this is not wholly new work. There will be two designated listeners and they are friends A.T. Miller and Lauren Brownlee. They may be reached through the email listener at fcnl.org. They can offer clearness and guidance to anyone who would like help thinking through these issues, sorting out an encounter, recognizing the impact on self or others, and discerning whether steps need to be taken or not taken. You can use this email to ask the designated listeners to contact you. The email will be checked regularly by AT and Lauren, but not minute by minute. So do have patience. Patience, you might recall, is one of our community agreements. There will be, beginning Thursday evening, affinity groups for people of color, LGBTQIA+, and European descent friends. Some will be facilitated by governance friends and some by our DEI consultants, Freedom Road. Please do not attend an affinity group that does not represent your identity. The affinity group times are offered throughout annual meeting and are listed in the program schedule. An important DEI role is to increase safety for all those attending here, governance friends, guests, and FCNL staff. And towards that goal, we are giving attention this year to microaggressions. Microaggressions are personal, highly impactful, 
often unconscious acts of dismissal, disregard, or defensiveness. Microaggressions happen in our broader US culture on a frequent basis. They also happen within and throughout the Religious Society of Friends. It is our desire to interrupt these behaviors so that every person experiences safety in our community and a sense of belonging. You can learn more about microaggressions through many channels and we encourage you to explore. We are uh, including a resource here from Pacific Yearly Meeting and their subcommittee on racial justice. You might find that some of the visuals on microaggressions in that document are particularly helpful. Some of the kinds of things that have been experienced as microaggressions in our community, in our FCNL community, are offering excessive praise to a young professional or a person of color, as if that level of expertise is not expected. Or noting how very articulate someone is, as if that's an unusual thing or asking questions about a person's home country, as if this is not their home, or inviting someone who has a faith tradition different than our own to try out Quakerism, as if another tradition is not as vital or rich. Taking undue amounts of time during a session, speaking over someone else, These micro actions may seem small, but when they are experienced over and over in one's life, subtle suggestions that a person is surprisingly competent or not one of us or not from here, they have a collective weight and they demonstrate a sense of cultural, a lack of cultural competency. So during workshops to help us both interrupt microaggressions as they happen and continue with the other advocacy work we came here to do, there will be process facilitators in place. When a process facilitator names a microaggression, we invite you to welcome those interruptions as acts of correction and safety and awareness. We ask you to bring curiosity to the forefront. The process facilitators will open the workshop and explain the system that we are using for identifying microaggression. We'll be naming an ouch and asking for an oops. And you may also name your own ouches and ask for oops in those sessions. The process facilitators will not be stopping the workshop to explain an ouch. This is not primarily an educational moment. It is simply about stopping the harm that is happening, returning to our community agreement of respect and trust. To offer an oops an, is an apology, and it does not mean that you have to understand what you have done. It does mean that you apologize for the impact of your words or actions on another, irrespective of your intention. So that perhaps bears repeating. If you are asked to offer an oops, it means that you are apologizing for the impact of your words or your actions on another, irrespective of your intention. Thank you for that discipline, friends. So you can look forward to the support of the process facilitators to assist in establishing safety and to keep us on track on our work. And if you observe or experience a violation of the community agreement, we encourage you to let us know and you can find a reporting form named, I believe, in the chat. 
Another gathering that has been a source of harm in the past is in worship sharing. And you will notice <clears throat> an, an addition to the worship sharing guidelines. It encourages friends to speak to an ouch that occurs in worship. Eldering in the context of worship is not new to friends. It is not frequently needed, but it is powerfully important when it is needed. Consider how open and vulnerable we are in the space of worship. We are all called upon to protect that space. The guideline for worship sharing that's been added this year is worship sharing involves centering into a sacred space which is maintained throughout the session and deepens as friends listen and share. Dialogue or interruptions are avoided with one exception. When someone says something harmful and spirit leads you to interrupt, do so. Harmful speech will change the dynamics within worship, whether or not it is addressed. So thank you, friends. And we thank General, Friends General Conference for the wording of this guideline. And thank you for helping us to make our worship service sacred, deep, and safe. Finally, our keynote speaker on Friday evening, as you know, is Vanessa July. She will speak with us about racism and its legacy on the Religious Society of Friends. And that presentation will be followed with worship sharing on her talk, our history, and our future. Our worship sharing group leaders will be offering some leadership to those small groups, and we encourage your participation in them. The field committee will be offering a Saturday workshop on Vanessa's book entitled Fit for Freedom, Not for Friendship, Quakers, African Americans, and the Myth of Racial Justice. And also on that Saturday, the DEI working group will be offering a workshop on its comprehensive work on this topic. And good luck choosing among all those workshops. <laughs> so it is, I hope, quite abundant that our attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion, our attention to the pernicious ways that race and class, patriarchy and militarism have played out in our very midst are being held closely as our own work in this time. Thank you friends for all that you are doing in this and other settings to move this work forward, for embodying courage and commitment to make things right, for exercising your muscles of trustworthiness and shockable persistence. I will end the, with these words from our community safety agreement. As Quakers, we are committed to our own transformation through God's refining fire as the necessary process in which to create the world we want to create, the world we seek. Thank you, friends. Well, thank you, Mary Lou. That uh, I feel like that got us off to an important uh, start and it helps us as we live into the beloved community we are seeking to create. Uh, what's next on our program is we're going to take uh, about a 15 minute break. Uh, one part of these video meetings, as we've been figuring out how to make them work, is to make sure that we take breaks. So please take a minute to rest to walk around, to stretch. We'll be coming back at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I think that's maybe 10 o'clock Pacific. I'm going to see if my math skills are good here. Uh, 9 o'clock Alaska, 8 o'clock Hawaii time. And uh, we'll, that's when we'll start with our keynote address for the day. Uh, and so, as Diane said, you're in the right place at the right time for the right work. So, friends, uh, see you in 15 minutes.
and welcome back. I hope you had a good break. Uh, this is when we really get down to doing the work that you all will have to do for the day. So time to get out your pencils and your pieces of paper and take notes. Or if you've got that Quaker Public Policy Institute briefing book like I have here, you can actually take notes there. I think Annie put some extra sheets of paper in there. Just a, again, a brief overview for those of you who are just joining us now. Um, I'm Diane's going to introduce Amelia. Amelia will brief us on the lobbying ask. Then Diane and Amelia will talk about some of the important questions that they think you may confront uh, as you go into these lobby visits. If you have questions, I really encourage you to post them in the YouTube chat. We've got Annie standing by at YouTube Central, and she's going to be monitoring that chat. And then after this session, we'll have an opportunity to talk about the Justice Award uh, that we're giving to a member of Congress this year who's right in the middle of these discussions. And then it's on to planning for your own lobby visits. First, we're going to review the materials, and then you're going to go into specific Zoom rooms by state to actually plan the back and forth of your own lobby visits, the most important work you can do today. But I'm not going to say more about that because Amelia is really the person who is every day on the Hill, and she can tell you why it's so important that you're here today. So I'm going to ask Diane Randall to come back on and introduce Amelia for us. Thanks, Jim. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Amelia Keegan, the director of uh, FCNL's domestic policy team. Let me say a little bit about Amelia. Those of you who've been to previous annual meetings have heard Amelia speak before. She is a powerful spokesperson for many economic justice issues that affect people who are poor and people who are struggling. And uh, the Build Back Better bill has many provisions that are going to address the needs of people who are very low income and particularly the needs of children. And the thing that I keep thinking about this bill, and we're, we're going to get into this after you hear Amelia talk, because we'll have a back and forth, but it just strikes me that investing in children is one of the best investments that we can make in this country. And so Amelia is going to talk to you a little bit about the breadth of the investments for people, families with children that this bill provides that you will be talking about when you go on the Hill. Well, let me say just a couple words about Amelia. Um, in addition to overseeing the team of lobbyists who work on domestic policy, and that includes our climate change portfolio, criminal justice reform, uh, our Native American program, uh, Amelia also carries a portfolio herself, which is economic justice. And uh, she does a great deal of work, as, as Jim referred to, in doing direct lobby visits on the Hill, as well as in coalitions, particularly faith-based coalitions. And this has been a powerful way that FCNL has been able to extend our work by working collegially with interfaith groups, as well as with the circle of protection. And we're going to come back and talk to you a little bit more about how these coalition partners really um, share a similar agenda and how our voices are getting heard on the Hill. But we also wanna make sure that you're equipped so that your voices will get heard as you go into the congressional offices, because it is hearing what constituents need, what constituents see on the ground that can be very, very powerful for members of Congress. So um, Amelia has been with FCNL for gosh, about five years now. She uh, does a terrific job uh, providing leadership, not just to the domestic policy team, but to our, our Hill strategy and working with constituents around the country. She also uh, is our staff liaison to FCNL's standing committee of the policy committee. Right before we started, you saw a reference to the fact that we're going to be doing priority setting. So she'll be working with the policy committee as, as they get ready to, to look at the legislative priorities next year. Uh, but today, let's get back to the Build Back Better bill and what, uh, what we can learn from Amelia Kagan as she uh, speaks to us for a, few minute, for a few minutes. And then later on, I'll come back and we'll do some questions and answers. Welcome, Amelia. Great. Thank you, Diane. And I just want to start off by saying what a joy it is to be with you all and how grateful I am for all you've done for FCNL and this work, some of you for decades. You know, annual meeting carries special meaning for me. 
The last time we gathered in person pre-COVID in 2019, I looked very different because by the end of annual meeting, I was about a week past my due date. So this gathering for me is also a celebration of the birth of my daughter. And I think about how naive I was. There's so much no one tells you as an expecting parent. After giving birth, you're told six weeks and you're back to normal. And at six weeks, my doctor said, you're good to resume your pre-pregnancy activities. And I had this idea that I would somehow continue my pre-pregnancy life just with a baby alongside for the ride. Obviously, that is not how it works. A baby fundamentally alters life's road. And physically, honestly, it took a full year before I felt like my body was mine again. But I am also a different person in some ways. My identity, my physical and emotional self, my life has been altered. And yet, having a child is the most miraculous blessing. No music, no song, nothing can compete with the sound of your own child's laughter. Holding her little hand in the park as she stares wide-eyed at the carousel, there is no greater joy. While not childbirth, living through COVID these past 20 months has been painful. And with the availability of vaccines, so many of us have been longing to get our pre-pandemic lives back. Hugging grandkids, gathering around dinner tables, going to movies, returning to work. Yet our world is forever changed. The pandemic and economic fallout shone a bright light on so many of the structural injustices and inequities in our society. Our country is at a crossroads. Before us lies an opportunity to birth a new kind of society. And the Build Back Better Act puts us on that path. It's not everything, but it could markedly transform the way we as a country support our children, families, and future. Universal pre-K and monumental investments in childcare. Real steps to address the affordable housing crisis and promote housing stability over half a trillion dollars towards clean energy and addressing the climate crisis, the largest financial commitment this country has ever made. Protections for immigrants, particularly young dreamers. And what we will speak to our members of Congress about, historic expansions to the earned income tax credit and child tax credit, which could cut America's ch child poverty rate nearly in half. What Social Security did to cut poverty among seniors, this will do to cut poverty among kids. So what are these credits? The child tax credit and the earned income tax credit are refundable tax credits. That means that people who don't earn enough money to owe taxes can still benefit. The credits come in the form of a check from the government. And these credits have a long history of bipartisan support. Paul Ryan pr proposed an earned income tax credit expansion nearly exactly what we're advocating for. Senator Romney's child tax credit proposal mirrors the expansion we're trying to extend. He just pays for it differently. So back in March, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan, which made really important expansions to the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit, but they are only for one year. So unless Congress acts, they'll expire next month. The Build Back Better Act extends all these expansions. So what are those expansions? First, the American Rescue Plan expanded the earned income tax credit by making it bigger for adults not raising children, a population that is often left out of America's social safety net. The Build Back Better Act extends this for one year. The Rescue Plan expanded the child tax credit in three ways. First, it made the kid credit larger for all families increasing the value of the credit from $2,000 to $3,000 per kid and $3,600 for kids under the age of six. The Build Back Better Act extends the larger credit amount for one year. The rescue plan also turns the key credit into a monthly payment. So families now get this benefit every month. 
The Build Back Better Act extends the monthly distribution for one year. Finally, and most important, the American Rescue Plan allowed families with little or no income to be able to get the full credit amount, what we call full refundability. Before, the parents of 26 million kids couldn't get the full credit, child tax credit because they earned too little money. Now they can. The Build Back Better Act makes this change permanent. This is huge. So when you are visiting with your representatives and senators, what do you say? If you remember nothing else from my remarks, remember this. We are asking Congress to extend the earned income tax credit and child tax credit expansions. And in particular, we want to make permanent the expansion that allows families with little or no income to claim the full value of the credit. Democratic offices can do this by passing the Build Back Better Act. Republican offices, we know they're not going to vote for Build Back Better, but we still need their support for these credits. These credits are doing enormous an enormous amount to help families make the basic needs. Within the first month that the enhanced child tax credit started going out, the number of adults living in households with children who didn't have enough to eat dropped by 3.3 million in one month. Families are using the credit, number one, to buy groceries. Second, utilities and rent. But I wanna step back and just share some personal stories. Maureen Boeing lost several sources of income from the pandemic. The child tax credit has been a lifeline, enabling her family to meet basic needs and pay bills, but also those extra things like her son's orthodontist bill. The child tax credit has helped Julia Callahan's family be prepared for unexpected emergencies. When they got a flat tire, the child tax credit was the extra income they needed to fix it. They've also used part of the credit to start a savings account for their 18 month old. And in the midst of the pandemic, as students braced for another semester of online learning, the expanded credit enabled Nikita Long to buy a computer for her daughter so she could participate in her classes. These credits are reducing poverty and hunger, but they're also helping to ensure a certain quality of life of orthodontist appointments and college savings. It means Christmas presents and music lessons, birthday cakes and carousel rides. The larger child tax credit amount is important. The monthly distribution is important, but allowing parents with little or no income to claim the full credit amount is the single biggest driver in the huge drops in child poverty in this bill. And that is why making that particular expansion permanent is such a big deal. Now, some want to go backwards and reinstate a work requirement. But shocker, when you impose work requirements in a society that already discriminates against people of color in employment and educational opportunities, you're going to exacerbate racial disparities. Expanding only the maximum credit amount from $2,000 to $3,000 and $3,600 for kids under the age six, but not making it fully refundable, reduces Black and Latinx child poverty rates by only about one percentage point. However, if you expand the maximum credit amount and you enable families with little or no income to claim the full credit amount, that cuts Black and Latinx child poverty rates by nine percentage points and cuts the racial disparities in child poverty rates by over 40%. Advancing racial justice does not only come in the form of police reform and criminal justice reform and immigration reform. It's also about reversing the policies that prevented people of color from purchasing homes, getting loans, starting businesses, qualifying for Social Security, benefiting from tax breaks, and accumulating wealth. And let's be real about where some of these calls for work requirements come from. Too much of it comes from racist stereotypes about welfare king, queens, and poor people who look a certain way being lazy. We have got to push back. The Build Back Better Act includes these earned income tax credit and child tax credit expansions. And the House is voting this week. And then in December, the Senate will vote. This is not a done deal. 
And the longer this drags out, the greater the danger that our priorities get cut or compromised. The House has got to pass this bill this week. And then between House passage and when the Build Back Better Act goes to the Senate, there's going to be some changes. Changes to fit the procedural requirements, but also Leader Schumer needs 50 votes. And as of now, he does not have that confirmed. I believe he'll get there, but the question is how long will it take and what will be negotiated away? And then even once he gets those 50 votes, we are expecting hundreds of bad amendments in the Senate. We already know there will be amendments to reinstitute work requirements on the child tax credit to prevent immigrants from getting the child tax credit and a host more. We need help from every senator to oppose all those amendments. This is it. This is the moment, the home stretch, to get this bill done. If you help us pass it, it will be marked in the history books. The last time we had this sort of legislative progress was 1965. Some say the New Deal. We may be in a moment of enormous opportunity, but I am fully aware that it is juxtaposed by the harsh political dynamics surrounding us. When congressional offices and their families receive death threats because they dared to vote for a bipartisan bill that would benefit their constituents, dared to put a functioning government above party loyalty, when school board meetings grow violent because parents fear their kids may learn the very real history and reality of racism in this country. When a 12 year old black boy is killed by police for simply carrying a toy gun while a 17 year old white kid can cross state lines with a very real and illegally acquired assault rifle, shoot three people, killing two of them, and then be treated as a toddler. When there are huge banners and signs prominently declaring F Biden, the elected president of this country in blatant display for my two-year-old to see, when members of Congress find it amusing to publish cartoons where they violently kill a Latina Congresswoman and the US president, and then not one person in party leadership says a word. I have to say, I don't know what to do with that. The level of hate and vitriolic anger and blatant racism that is out there, it's depressing. And the feeling of powerlessness over where this country could be headed is overwhelming. Scripture may not provide immediate solutions or easy answers, but it does provide some context. What we are witnessing is nothing new. The Apostle Paul's life demonstrates this perfectly. Paul travels, sharing the good news, sharing a new worldview. What he teaches is different from what people are used to. It doesn't fit the neat history of what they've been told. Violence erupts. Parents don't want their kids learning this new theory, this new way of relating to the world. Can you see where I'm going with this? Paul's preaching in Ephesus actually causes a riot because it is impacting the pocketbooks of the business elites. You see, Paul tells the people not to put their faith in material objects. And now those who have profited handsomely from selling those material objects are angry because their bottom lines are affected. In Jerusalem, a crowd surrounds Paul, drags him out of the temple, pummeling him with fists and death threats because he's preaching love and hanging out with folks not like them. He is arrested and the governor, Felix, is more concerned about upsetting a certain base of people and getting a bribe than he is with justice. Let me say that again. 
rather than holding a racist mob accountable for storming the temple and inciting violence on groundless fears and conspiracy theories, this political leader is more interested in campaign contributions and his political power than he is about justice. How did Paul get through it all? While Paul started his life dependent on himself, he ended his life dependent on something bigger. Paul had faith in the Almighty. Rather than trying to control the world, Paul focused on his place within it. He found his calling, driven to be God's hands and feet, and he just kept going. Persistent in his work, undaunted, undeterred, Paul didn't turn away. Although a Roman citizen, he didn't hide in his privilege. He didn't decide to just focus on his nephew's swim meets or numb it out by binge watching succession. And he didn't throw that anger and vitriol right back. He didn't respond with violence or turn around with his own F. Demetrius banners. Paul models a way forward. And when I think of that way, I think of FCNL. Like Paul, we are steadfast in our values, refusing to turn away from the mess of the world without being succumbed by it. Knowing that we are not in control of the world, but focusing on that which we can control to bring about the beloved community. The beloved community, which enables human flourishing for all, from parents struggling to pay a child's, for a child's braces to the ones chanting, let's go Brandon. We will go forward boldly pursuing that vision of the world we see, and we will just keep going. My daughter loves that carousel at the park. We often talk about a revolution, but you know what the definition of a revolution is? You go around and you end up in the same spot. That is the technical definition of one revolution. But at that park, there's also a kid's train. And my daughter loves that train even more than the carousel. The train always moves forward. Build back better is no carousel. We are propelling ourselves forward ever nearer to the world we see. Because when we come together as a community, when we light up the halls of Congress and the phone lines of Russell and Dirksen and Hart and Rayburn and Cannon and Longworth, and when we speak truth with love as relentless advocates, we light up the way before us to birth a new normal, a new normal where all toddlers have birthday pies and carousel rides, a new normal where pre-kindergarten is universal, a new normal where parents no longer pay more on childcare than they do on rent. A new normal where the U.S. finally joins the race of other countries to offer paid family and medical leave. A new normal where we're doing more to reduce carbon emissions than we are increasing COVID hospital admissions. A new normal where all politicians put more passion into voting rights than they do a teenager's guns rights. A new normal where masking and scientifically based health precautions are just as popular as Ted Lasso. A new normal where rather than debating the withdrawal of Afghanistan, we're not invading countries in the first place. A new normal where there is abundance and flourishing for all God's children. We are on this path together. It doesn't matter where you are on the way, you are here today. You are needed today. In this moment of America's history, you have a role to play because we are in a moment right now being called right now as part of a larger story to loose the reins of injustice. A way has opened, an opportunity lies before us. As Isaiah reads, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. We are ready for some ways in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to help transform this nation and create something new, something more beautiful than what was there before. Let us pull up the dawn of a new era, guided forward by God's blazing love and grace to birth a new kind of society, a new kind of community, a new kind of future for our world. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your work. Now let's go out and lobby and get Build Back Better signed into law.
Thank you, Amelia. You carry such passion, a passion that so many people who you work with, so many people who are on this call feel. Um, maybe we aren't all quite as eloquent as you are in throwing that out and laying it down, but wow, thank you for that. Thank you for the reminder of what, what we're doing here. We're not simply asking legislators to pass a bill. We are asking them for justice. We are asking for equity. And that's a big deal. And this is a moment. This is a moment of opportunity that, that I haven't seen in my decade of time at FCNL. And as you said, some people may not have seen since the 1960s in terms of change. So I wanna get into a little bit of description about some of the politics and more about the policy of what's going on right now help people think about what kind of pushback they may get in congressional offices or what kind of stories even they may wanna make sure that they tell. So uh, let me start by saying this bill has had different names, right? The White House uh, and President Biden who has proposed the bill call it the Build Back Better, but it's also known as the Reconciliation Bill and some people can come up with different names. So give us a little bit of the policy politics framework as we go in, how we're talking about it. And, and what you mentioned that we may see a vote in the house. Love to have you just tell us, lay it out, lay out a little bit of the timeline because it's certainly been up and down, back and forth and all around. And so um, just go ahead and talk about that for a little bit. And then I'm gonna come in and ask some more specifics about what's in the bill. Sure, sure. So yeah, it has got, you know, there have been many, as you said, names about how this bill has been uh, termed. It is now, it was the reconciliation bill before it had an official title because that was the budget process that they were using to pass it. Um, so it would avoid uh, a filibuster in the Senate. But now it's got a title. It's the Build Back Better Act. Um, and so that's sort of what we are now calling it. Um, and that's what most folks on the Hill are, are calling it as well. And as for the timeline, um, so yes, we have been, if you talk to congressional offices, we have been on the cusp of passing this thing for a while, but now we, now we really are down to the wire here. Um, so the bill is about to um, going for, before the House. We expect to vote potentially Friday um, we'll see. It might it might be Saturday, um, but the House is going to vote on this. Then it goes, as I said, to the Senate, where we expect some changes, um, and there are going to be some real big questions about uh, what changes do they make to make sure that they get pr pr primarily to line up all fifty votes, and then after that, it will have it'll go through this crazy amendment process that I mentioned where we're expecting a lot of bad amendments, mm -hmm. and then it'll go back to the House again. They need to get this done really before the end of the year, um, partly because the child tax credit and earning income tax credit, like those expansions end at the end of the year. The last child tax credit check goes out December 15th. So we need to make sure that j by January 15th, families are still getting that, that uh, check. Okay. All right. There's so many things I want to ask. And we also um, are getting questions in the YouTube chat. So at the end of the time, at the end of this hour, we're going to turn back to Annie and have her give us some of those questions. But let's go to that issue. Let's go to the child tax credit and talk a little bit more. So the American Rescue Plan raised the amount of money that families get. It also uh, extended it to more families. And I think where this got my attention is I was talking to someone in my family, extended family in the Midwest, who I didn't necessarily think that they would qualify for the child tax credit. And they talked about the fact that, yeah, they were going to start getting this child tax credit, you know, deposited in their bank account and what a difference it would make, you know? So I, you, you spoke about some of those differences for some families, but I think, I think anyone who either themselves has had to make choices about what they spend their monthly income on, or have seen that in their extended family, where there's a choice about whether you can pay for your child to have particular kinds of music lessons or play in the soccer team, or even whether you can buy certain food at the grocery store because of the end of the month, or, or whether you have to make a choice about paying for your light bill or paying for your internet bill. I mean, we really are talking about that for some families, that's the choices that are being made. And it's, it is about quality of life, but it's also about basic education and uh, access to food and services. So 
the, the thing that I think is also elegant about the child tax credit is the way it's administered, right? That there is already a system set up through a federal government so that this, this just kind of show, shows up. It's almost like a guaranteed uh, monthly income. Can you say a little bit more about that and, and why, you know, extending that can really make a difference over time beyond why, you know, the essence of needing to do that beyond this second pandemic year and, and why we are so um, excited about the possibility to extend that uh, certainly within the Build Back Better bill, but also beyond even the, what's in the bill. Yeah, great question, Diane. So yeah, what we actually have with the, the child tax credit expansions, we now have a child allowance in this country, um, much like um, a number of other countries. And it, it is sort of a, a form of universal basic income that goes to um, nearly all parents. And um, I mean, I, I can get into all sorts of things about, about how, um, how beneficial this credit is, but I'll just point to one, um, one study that came out of California that actually showed that um, families who do receive a sort of um, child allowance or universal basic income, their incomes went up over time, right? That, that space and that allowed them to allow people to, um, to actually get a better job, right? And, and we saw, so, so the, the benefits for families over the long term is really, really huge. This really is investing in families. Um, and when you look at where our resources go as a country, we actually do a terrible job compared to other countries in investing in children. And so the Build Back Better Act, particularly through the child tax credit expansions, but really through so many provisions of the bill, really put a whole lot more into investing in our children and our future. Right. People who are part of FCNL know that we've long talked about where investments, federal taxpayers go, and we have some disputes with how Congress prioritizes some of those investments into the Pentagon. Um, this is an opportunity to make investments in people. And we're focusing right now on children and families. And there are other parts of the bill that we may want to get into and talk a little bit. But I want to just stick with the, the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit both. And we'll go to that in a minute. I want to talk about this issue around work requirements, because as you pointed out, this is a live, live question. It's something Senator Manchin has raised. We expect that we might see some amendments on it. People may get that question when they go into an office. They may have someone saying, well, don't you think people should have to work? And, you know, my guess is a lot of us love work and we think work is good and we do think it's a good thing for people to work. But is this, a, is this an anti-work bill? Is it gonna discourage work? So, so say a little bit more about that and why, why is it okay for, for us, for government to support families who may not be fully employed? I think that's, yeah, that's a, a legitimate sorry. issue. Let's talk about it. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question, Diane, and, and something certainly we have heard a lot about. And, and this, you know, for those who were lobbying with us in 2018 would remember we were pushing back against them about putting work requirements on um, nutrition assistance. I mean, part of it is one, basically, hands down, we shouldn't be punishing kids because of their parents' you know, work status. And, and this is about kids and investing in children and their future. So I think that's kind of bottom line. But I think the other piece of this is like work requirements are unnecessary and don't work. So the vast majority of families who receive the child tax credit are already working. And those who aren't are either in between jobs um, or they're, uh, they're elderly, caring for really young kids under the age of two, or sick or disabled. So you think about, um, you know, we don't want to be taking away the child tax credit from grandparents who are primary caregivers of their grandkids. Um, and just how work requirements really don't wouldn't wouldn't really help in terms of um, uh, do much in terms of labor force participation. But the other thing is we actually have concrete studies that show that um, providing the child tax credit doesn't actually lead parents to um, to to leave the workforce. We've seen that from studies both in Canada and in the U.S. And then also there's that study I'd mentioned out of California that shows that giving people extra money actually helps them get better jobs and leads to higher incomes in the future. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, I stressed in my remarks how allowing families with little or no income to claim the full value of the credit, 
that is, again, that is the single biggest driver in the huge drops of, of child poverty from this bill. That cutting child poverty by nearly 40, per, by nearly 50 percent, like that is because um, we don't have work requirements on the child tax credit. Um, of the 4.1 million kids who are lifted out of poverty by, all the, by the overall child tax credit expansions, 3.6 million are lifted out of poverty from allowing parents with little or no income to um, claim the full value of the credit. So um, I think those are just a few examples of why, like, it's just a terrible idea to impose work requirements. You know, uh, one of the things that, that we've been thinking about um, uh, is just when, when did this decline, you know, start that we, w that in our country where we stopped investing in families. And, and that's, um, I mean, I, I was reading an op-ed, some of the people may have seen that about like during the Reagan era about how we began making cuts to a lot of safety net programs that have had a dramatic impact on, on households and, and families. And I also remember reading about, you know, I mean, we were talked about the sixties when we began investing in um, el the elderly in our country and creating programs that supported people who are, who are um, retiring, who are elderly. I mean, the fact is that if we invest in people, they flourish. Um, and so that's kind of a bottom line that, that we need to think about. I want to thank you for sharing this story and re re reminding me, I remember two years ago when you did look different and uh, remember like watching you take long walks, you were waiting uh, for delivery. Um, but you know, when, when we were talking about this, this session uh, for annual meeting, one of the things I shared with you is that when my children were young, um, I remember thinking about the fact that they would, they, they, you know, we, we weren't in poverty. We had, we had sufficient, you know, funds to, to pay for the, the sort of extras. I mean, we weren't a wealthy family, but we were strictly middle-class, but they went to school with people, with children who were poor. And I could see the, the challenge of having, I mean, even, we don't want to see any children poor, but it doesn't benefit our children to be with children who are poor either. I mean, there is a benefit for everyone when we invest in children, it is not, it is, it is certainly for those households, but it is for society at large. And that the, not just the economic opportunities for the whole families, but the educational and economic futures of those children make a difference now if we invest when they're uh, born and when they are growing up. So talk a little bit more about some of the other features, even though we're gonna focus on the child tax credit, can you just name a couple of the other things you mentioned, um, you, you know, preschool, uh, what's in the bill still and what's being talked about? Talk a little bit about that, if you would. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and just to quickly say, yeah, we also have a lot of data that shows that kids who get the child tax credit and earned income tax credit do better in school, right, are healthier as adults, have higher incomes as adults, are less likely to be involved in the criminal justice system. So we know that those these initial kind of investments have huge benefits for society over the long term. But yeah, this bill has a lot, like that's why it's so historic. The child tax credit and earned income tax credit provisions alone are historic. But you know, we've been talking with some congressional offices where it's like, if you were to take everything in this bill and each of those provisions um, was a single bill, we'd be going bonanzas over the just number of legislative victories we've been having. So um, there is a lot, like the child care provisions are just, just huge and go alongside with the universal pre-K um, pieces in there. I mean, you think about just how how incredibly unaffordable childcare is um, for so many families and how incredibly important that is for parents to be able to work and have like um, a, a sense of, you know, to, to know that your kid is okay while you're working is, is also incredibly important. So, um, so those pieces, there's also, um, people may have read about, um, there was dispute, but in the, um, House version right now, there is still the paid family and medical leave provisions in there. It's four weeks, which has gotten trimmed down, but it is still in there. Also hugely important. Um, and of course, like enormous investments in, in uh, climate change, uh, as well as uh, the, the immigration provisions that provide really important protections for um, many undocumented uh, individuals. So it's just you can just go down the list uh, there again, this bill, if it passes, will truly be transformational. 
So I want to invite you to talk a little bit more about some of those provisions, because I do know that there are people who care a lot about the other elements that are in the bill uh, around immigration and around climate change. But I also want to just name one other thing. You, when you compared the cost of childcare, which again, if anyone has children or grandchildren, you know that people are paying a lot, right? The other thing people pay a lot for in this country is housing. And there are some pretty amazing provisions and investments in affordable housing in this bill as well that have uh, the opportunity to address homelessness um, as well as to prevent people from falling into homelessness or, or falling behind on rent. So I just wanted to, to, you know, if you want to mention anything more, please do. But I wanted to lift that up as really an important investment in this as well. But but talk, let's talk let's talk about climate change a little bit because the uh, clearly this has been an important platform for this administration to address climate change. Um, the initial uh, recommendation in the bill got taken out, but there still is a lot of investment in there that would go a long way uh, to support renewable energy and to address climate change. So can you talk just a little bit about that as well, Amelia? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you pretty much said it, hundreds of billions of the dollars to really promote um, clean energy is is just to, to really help us getting in that direction. That is huge. I mean, of course, we were incredibly disappointed when the clean electricity performance payment program was taken out. Um, you know, we, we wanted to see that in. We want to see a carbon, a price on carbon included. In. Um, and so this is one of the, those areas where you know, this is what we do as faithful advocates, right? We're going to get this bill passed and then we're going to come right back around and start lobbying for the carbon tax and, and all of the other things that didn't make it in this bill. But, um, but I think we don't want to lose sight of, like, as you mentioned, so many of the historic and really major investments that are still um, in this legislation. So uh, before we get to questions, let's talk a little bit about the provisions that address immigration. That has been another area of um, policy work that has been a real frustration in Congress, honestly. And, and I don't want to put it all linked to just the Build Back Better bill because there's a much greater um, array of legislation that, that we're tracking that Anika, who's our, our lobbyist in this area, is paying attention to. But there's specifically some hopes that there would be uh, some ability to move forward in some elements of addressing uh, issues of immigration. Um, so can you say a little bit about that? Because people probably have read a little bit about the parliamentarian's decision, what can be in, what can be out. So so um, just give us a little background on that, if you could. Yeah. Um, so and, and I will stress, too, again, if you want to know more about any of these things, the lunch with the lobbyist sessions are a great way to kind of really get into the nitty gritty of all the details, um, both with Clarence and with Anika. Um, so on the immigration provisions, um, couldn't get, you know, because they're moving this bill um, through a specific process that allows them to avoid the filibuster in the Senate, there are a lot of procedural um, requirements and a lot is up to the parliamentarian. And so uh, a pathway, a clear pathway to citizenship for, um, for DREAMers, for TPS recipients, farm workers, and other essential workers was essentially the parliamentarian said that that did not pass um, the requirements. So they're moving forward with a different, they've worked out a different few different strategies right now. Um, they're looking at really protections for, for many of these um, communities and um, that would allow for um, work authorization, protections from deportation for like a five-year period that then could be a, get renewed for another five year period. So that's kind of what they're looking at. I think there's a lot up in the air on that provision, um, both on the parliamentarian. We don't know if this is the, how the parliamentarian will rule on that provision yet, but then also to get um, to get the, the votes to be able to pass the bill with those provisions included as well. Okay, I'm gonna be, um, I'm gonna play um, a difficult member of Congress or Congressional Office for just a minute and uh, ask you to answer a question because uh, we we have some answers, even we anticipate these because you've heard some of them when you've been in offices. Uh, so here it is. Um, so this Build Back Better bill, it was a $3 trillion bill and we've been able to whittle it down. So it's not that big, but it's still way too big. Why do we have to make that kind of, why, how can we even afford to spend that kind of money? Uh, that This is not the time to be spending that money. What, you know, it's just way too big. Yeah, so I, a few things um, on that. I mean, I think one of the, the pushbacks we hear along those lines is people aren't necessarily only saying it's too big. They're saying we're spending too much money and they're worried about deficits. 
And that drives me bonkers because this bill is paid for, right? There are some really important revenue provisions in here that raise taxes on wealthier individuals and corporations. And so it is um, pretty much entirely offset. There's one small provision that we expect the Congressional Budget Office sort of disagrees with some of the other analysis on. But overall, this bill is paid for. And the other thing that's if you care about deficit reduction, this most of the spending pieces go for, you know, the investments are for maybe a couple years, 10 years, but they most of them expire at some point. We're going to have to do a lot of work to keep them going. But the revenue increases don't expire. So out after 10 years, we're raising a bunch, a bunch of money that is not really, that's just going for deficit reduction. So if you care about deficit, long-term deficit reduction, this bill is a great bill for you. Um, and then I think just on the whole kind of we're spending too much overall, um, I think FCNL advocates are in a great position to be like, well, let's compare that with what we spend in the Pentagon, right? Like, um, so I, I, I think there are many different um, responses to, to that pushback. Well, and we've really avoided trying to talk about the, uh, you know, go in and say, we want you to pass this bill that is this size. What we want are the elements of the bill because we know what they can do. And that that kind of investment, I mean, you know, anyone who has thought about when you, that it does cost something to make investments because you get outcomes and you get returns on that as investments. And that's what we're really talking about. We're talking about the kinds of returns that we know will pay off. Maybe not, you know, we'll, 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 have, we'll have benefits for our society and for human beings, human beings to flourish in our society. And so that's really what this is about, I think. But I, I'm glad you mentioned how uh, the revenue aspects of it, because while we haven't led with that as our advocacy, you have been pretty involved with some coalitions that have been paying attention to that those revenue opportunities. And particularly, um, those are very popular to, to ask corporations that aren't paying taxes to pay taxes and to, uh, to look at the disproportionate benefits that a few small number of billionaires receive versus what other people receive. And that's some of what's in this, this bill for revenue raising, I believe. If you can, do you wanna say anything more about that? And then, then I will turn to you, Annie, for some questions from you too. Yeah, well, I always love talking about tax policy, so absolutely. Um, I mean, yes, I, I would say when you look at the, the revenue position, the revenue provisions are important because they have help pay for our investments, right? But they're also great policies in and of themselves. You know, as you mentioned, there are so many wealthier individuals and corporations who are paying very little or no tax. And we need to bring some fairness and equity to our tax code because also we're um, to be able to uh, invest in the things and, and create the society that we know we can and should have, that's required. But I also want to pinpoint just the ways in which we, um, our tax code, particularly tax or doesn't tax wealth um, and favors wealth, that has really perpetuated the racial wealth gap. And um, there are so many areas within our tax code that do continue to perpetuate the racial wealth gap. But that is one area that is just, I think, egregious um, in terms of our, our, tax, our tax policies that could really do a lot if we made some revisions there to bring much more equity to our, to our tax code and our society. Thank you for bringing that back to the the notion that this this is a this is a bill that does take steps to address racial inequities uh, in not only the tax code but in the distribution of some of the resources from it. And I think, uh, as we have talked about the the need for addressing equity, it's important to understand that this is a bill that will help do that. And I so I I, I really I thank you for lifting that up again. Okay, Annie, do we have any questions in the YouTube chat? Yes, we do, Diane. There's actually a very robust conversation happening in the chat right now. A lot of back and forth, a lot of comments. Um, it's really clear to me that, you know, this legislation brings up a lot for a lot of people. This is this is legislation that really affects people's lives. And, you know, I, I just wanted to mention that we are seeing some use of the oops and out, ouch language in the chat, and that's good. We're glad that we're embracing that. And, you know, these are sometimes very difficult conversations, and we're not going to have them perfectly. And so I'm just really excited to see that we are, as a community, striving to be better in this way together. And before I turn to questions, I just want to say one other thing, which is Amelia 
after your beautiful speech, you didn't get to hear the roaring and raucous applause that I know is happening all across the country. I pulled a few quotes. Someone said, if we could hear each other, we hear lots of clapping and cheering and crying. There were so many amens and preach it, lots of tears, a mic drop, um, people saying they were so excited to lobby and that they want to get this passed. So I just want you to know how impactful that speech really was for folks. Um, but with that, I want to turn to a couple of questions. I do want to acknowledge that we don't have time to get to all the questions in the chat, but Abby has also been dutifully responding in the chat um, with questions, uh, with answers. And whatever we don't get to here, we do also have that office hours happening today at 5.30. So definitely come swing by office hours. Amelia will be there. Abby will be there. I think a couple other staff members will also be there. So fear not, plenty of time to get all your nitty gritty questions answered. Um, but someone asked, Ross asked, does, okay, so this one stumped me. So Amelia, are you ready? Does, C, does CBO score the positive budgetary impacts of programs that reduce demands on social services and programs and give now vulnerable people the chance to become healthy tax paying workers going forward? That is a great question. Um, so I think what uh, you're referring to is what often called dynamic scoring. And so um, looking at just not what the initial cost of something is, but sort of the long-term impacts. You, we often, I've heard this most often talked in the, about in the context of say tax cuts. People say, oh, you cut taxes, it's gonna cost that much money, but it's gonna lead to so much economic growth that we really shouldn't count it as, as costing that much money. And um, the argument being, well, if you can do that on the tax side, you should be able to do that on the spending side. The, so I think there have been a lot of pushes to do that. Um, my understanding is that it gets pretty complicated and hard to actually measure out what those long-term um, costs are. So I believe the CBO scores that um, the Congressional Budget Office scores that, we're expect that are coming out right now, and I think we'll have the final budget score hopefully Friday, um, uh, will not include sort of those additional dynamic pieces. That's great. Thank you so much, Amelia. So we had a couple of questions that were sort of getting at, you know, how do you battle sort of the disinformation that you might get in some offices, such as one example is, you know, I'm hearing from people that extra money coming in is helping people quit. And we have 4 million people who have quit the workforce and it's hurting the economy, um, which we know isn't true. But how do you respond to, you know, pushback like that from congressional offices? Yeah, I mean that's that's it's it's hard. I, I mean I think the the thing the there's a lot of data that actually disproves that, and the reason why people aren't going back to work is not because they're getting this extra, you know, whatever whether it's two fifty or three hundred dollars a month. It's usually because they're getting paid too low. The work conditions aren't great, and let's be honest, like the childcare situation, the childcare situation, so. Throughout this pandemic, so many child care centers had to close down. Um, parents it led to, we have seen just huge, um, a lot of women leaving the workforce. And so it's not because people are getting these additional benefits. It's because they don't have the access to reliable child care. They're not going into to, um, workplaces that they feel are safe. And so um, I, would, I, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of data to, to show that, um, that that's just not an accurate assumption. Absolutely. And Abby sent a really helpful um, resource in the chat that uh, I hope that folks are able to check out um, on a blog post that FCNL has actually written uh, sort of about how to how to combat some of this pushback. Similarly, another question asking, you know, what if people want to know, how are we ensuring that the money actually goes to benefit kids? How do we make sure the money is being spent well once families have the money? I mean, there's no like accounting right we don't go and check in on how people are are using this i think it, it's we leave it up to families because we know families know what's best for them and for their kids in the same way that the irs you know with your ref, with everyone else's refund checks they don't go around kind of checking what are you spending your refund check on so i there's oftentimes this additional scrutiny that we place on um, lower income families that i think you know families are just trying to get by and we the other thing is like the data dis any concerns that folks have that people are not using this money wisely is disproven by the data, right? Um, by the fact that like 
the number one usage of the child tax credit when those expanded benefits started coming out was on groceries, number one. And second was on rent and utilities. So we know it's going to pay for basic needs. And then I think the other thing is bringing in those stories, right? To show there are just so many, a plethora of stories of families talking about parents, talking about how they're using this these benefits. And it's it's going to like saving for their kids. It's going for, you know, that those braces. It's going for the music lessons. So it's, um, I, I think there's just a wealth of, of information out there that just, just proves that. Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you also mentioned the ideas of stories because we're going to hear some stories um, from, from folks later on in this programming. And I think that is such an important aspect of our lobbying and the real power of our constituent lobby visits is that you don't need to have every single answer to push back, but you need to make sure that the office knows how important you think this legislation is. Um, and you do that through your stories. Uh, so sort of switching gears a little bit and thinking more about the actual visit, my, you know, my senator, let's imagine my senator says these decisions are being made by leadership and they don't have any influence on these issues. What do you say to that? So um, I would say that every, sen every senator, every member is important in this vote. Let us remember how tight the margins are. Um, so uh, two things, one is the member can do a lot, um, to be talking to leadership and to be talking to their colleagues, particularly if, um, if let's say your, your member is like totally on board and it's like, I'm totally supportive of Build Back Better. There's nothing I can do. That member has relationships with other members that they can be lobbying and telling, hey, these are really important provisions. We gotta keep them strong. We gotta get this bill across the finish line. And to say, yeah, hold firm, hold firm on this stuff. The other piece that I mentioned is um, the, in the Senate, I mean, as a, we are expecting hundreds, hundreds of bad amendments that are gonna be going that will be very hard for many members to vote against because a lot of them are being political messaging and we need, you know, that's going to take every single member, everyone we can get to push back upon. So I think, I think that's the other piece. And then the other thing that I would just finally mention is particularly with Republican offices, um, the Build Back Better Act only extends much of the earned income tax credit and child tax credit expansions. Um, for one year. So we're going to have to come right back around and get these uh, these expansions uh, extended further, made permanent ultimately. And that's going to require Republican support. Well, and that actually tees up my last question perfectly um, before we have to move on uh, to our next programming, which is, can you just say a little bit more about, you know, for our friends who are going into Republican offices, what, you know, what are what are the couple of sentences that you want them saying to Republicans who don't support the deal? They just talk about the importance of the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit. These are, you know, every family there. There are every member has just so many such a high percentage of the families in their district are getting particularly the child tax credit benefits right now and what it is doing for community for their communities and that we cannot let these expansions expire. And so talking, I think just bringing it back and saying, we really need to ensure that these, that your earned income tax credit and the child tax credit expansions are extended and that we keep them. Well, that was so great. Thank you so much, Amelia. I know that we didn't get to everyone's questions in the chat, but like I said, we do have those office hours happening at 5.30 Eastern today. So there's definitely a lot more FaceTime with Amelia and with Abby. Um, and really, we're going to make sure that you feel totally confident going into your visits. But a big part of that is just knowing how much you care about this legislation, which based on the chat, I can already see is so true. So we're so excited to have you engaging with us on this really important legislation. Let me just say thank you, Annie, for bringing those questions to us. You did a great job. Thank you for also sharing what was in the chat that people are using the the oops and 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 uh, ouch and that you know we'll look we we can't see that Amelia and I can't see that in the in the view we're in so uh, helpful to know that and helpful to know there's a real dynamic engagement on this and I I just want to reflect um, uh, this is also legislation that is uh, gender positive for women 
um, a lot of the a lot of the um, uh, kind of uh, idea that um, I, I, um, this notion of how do we know people will spend their money well um, that is that is just a, you know a kind of um, um, paternalism that is not um, that that we need to lose. <laughs> Uh, we need to trust people to do what's right for their families. And we need to trust uh, mothers and fathers to do what's right for their children. And this legislation sets up a system that that can happen. And so, um, and it's and it's also proven. And I, I wanna just go back and say one more thing before we go on to our next programming, which people may have missed. Uh, uh, while we do not have bipartisan support for the Build Back Better plan right now, the elements that we are talking about do have enjoyed bipartisan support historically. The child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, many of the provisions for housing vouchers, these historically have had a great deal of Republican support. So while they are not, we aren't seeing it in this particular bill, these are not ideas that belong only to Democrats. And that's important to remember as we're having this conversation. These are not based on party affiliation. They're based on what's right and best for human beings particularly the children who are human beings among us. With that, I'll turn it back over to Jim. Thanks, Diane. And uh, thanks, Amelia. This has just uh, been a really great way to start off our lobbying and to call us back to the community. The world that we seek. Uh, we're gonna close this session now uh, and then start right back up in, a, in just less than a minute with uh, a new award that FCNL just started a few years ago called the Justice Award. So just uh, give us a couple of seconds to transition. Well, welcome back, friends, and uh, on to the next element of our programming, which is uh, FCNL's Justice Award. But you've heard a lot from me already, so I'm going to pass it over to Diane. We'll talk about this award uh, and uh, explain a little bit about why we're doing it. Okay, sorry about that, Jim. I uh, just had to get my mic back on. <laughs> I'm still I'm still organizing my uh, screen here a little bit. So thank you for bearing with us. Uh, we've got some professional help here, but uh, not all of us are as adept at, at maneuvering here. So I just want to extend my sympathy and empathy to those of you who are still kind of figuring out all your um, screening. So, um, but I am I am really excited about uh, being part of this. And uh, speaking of hearing from people, you have heard from me a lot today already. But uh, this is the last time you'll be seeing me today, but I will be back tomorrow and the day after and the day after and hope you will be joining us for all of those sessions. Um, and I just want to underscore um, Annie's invitation to participate in the uh, uh, the getting all your questions answered. Uh, both Abby, who works closely with Amelia, as well as Amelia will be in those sessions. Uh, they've both been working really closely on the Hill on, on all of this legislation and will be able to, I think, address anything you have questions on. So I uh, hope you'll join us back here. So about three years ago, we started giving an award. We've, we've long given an award for peace and nuclear disarmament called the Ed Snyder Peace and Nuclear Disarmament Award. And we will be giving that award later on in our programming this uh, during this annual meeting. But we started giving an award, uh, a justice award for some domestic uh, leadership and domestic policy. And so it is the justice award that I, I want to present today and ask Amelia to join me in, in talking a little bit about the recipient of this award. Um, I will say that, um, again, talking about some of the programming um, that we're putting together is that we have uh, videos uh, from our recipients, but this video we didn't receive in time to put it into this part of the program, but you will see it um, later on uh, if you stay with us, uh, either, I'm not sure if it'll be today, but at some point we'll get it plugged in. But let me say a little bit about the person getting this award. And I am really excited that uh, FCNL is giving our justice award to Rosa DeLauro, Connecticut's third congressional, the, the representative from Connecticut's third congressional district. She has represented that district since 1991. 
She's a member of the House Leadership and she is chair of the Powerful Appropriations Committee. The reason we're giving Rosa DeLauro this award is that she has been one of the architects of the child tax credit and a passionate advocate to address child poverty. It's really the reason that we believe she so merits this award from the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Time and time again, she has demonstrated her commitment to help the least among us. 18 years ago, she first introduced the child tax credit and worked to make it fully refundable. She hasn't given up since then. With each new Congress, you continue, she continued to introduce the American Family Act to expand the child tax credit. And thanks to Representative DeLauro's leadership and determined commitment to children, Congress has significantly expanded the child tax credit in the American Rescue Plan in March. And it is those provisions that we are seeking to extend through the Build Back Better law. These changes, according to several studies, did uh, cut child poverty and we believe it can continue to do that. We really appreciate her leadership in working to make these expansions permanent. Thanks to Representative DeLauro, child poverty has taken a massive blow. So as we said before, within the first few months, uh, we've already seen dramatic drops in food insecurity and in helping pay rent and pay for those quality of life uh, supports that we talked about previously. Healthy families, healthy children require so much more. And Representative DeLauro has worked to try to support universal paid family leave, which promotes healthy childhood development and economic security. As Amelia mentioned in the last session, right now the House provision of the Build Back Better Act does include four weeks of paid family leave. Um, and I will say that Representative DeLauro has been a fierce champion for investing in children, families, and critical human, program, human needs programs. In her 30 years in Congress, Congresswoman DeLauro has consistently been led by her compassion, her conscience, and her faith. Our general committee designated this award uh, to recognize the congressional leadership for justice consistent with FCNL's commitment to seeking a society with equity and justice for all and a community in which every person's potential can be fulfilled. So as I said, we don't have a recorded message to show you at this moment, but we will have one later. Um, I do want to invite Amelia to share a couple of stories about her advocacy with Congresswoman DeLauro. And um, I'm gonna share a little bit more too, because I have gotten to watch Congresswoman DeLauro for many, many years before I came to FCNL uh, in her work representing Connecticut, where I lived before I came to work uh, here. So, but, but, uh, Amelia, talk a little bit about some of your recollection of working with Congresswoman DeLauro and, and specifically how her leadership has made a difference on these issues that we care so much about. Thanks, Diane. Yeah, um, Rosa DeLauro, she, she is a force. And I think with, particularly on, on those issues that she really, really cares about, the child tax credit really being one of them, um, but just investments in children and family, she is absolutely relentless. Um, I mean, Diane, you were you were there with her at the press conference conference uh, a couple of weeks ago with Speaker Pelosi and, and Congresswoman DeLauro, and she will speak like all the time. She is you know, like talking about the need for the child tax credit expansion, and she will keep pressing on the need to make all those expansions permanent. Like she is just dogged, and I like I remember just um, a conversation with her. I think it was about 10 years ago, um, right after Congress had passed the um, some some of the earlier expansions to the child tax credit, which, um, uh, you know, may, were, were huge. But uh, she, her big thing was like, we're going to get I remember her telling me we're going to get um, full refundability for the child tax credit. We're going to make sure that every single parent, regardless of what their income is, can get the full value of the child tax credit. And she has just been relentless in pursuing that um, and has not given up. And I think, um, I also think about, you know, her her fierce kind of advocacy. If, you, if anyone was watching like Biden's first State of the Union address, you'll notice that like when he finished and he was kind of walking down, who was right there? It was Rosa DeLauro 
kind of pinning him and, and having a, a, a conversation. And I am pretty sure they were talking about the child tax credit because at that time there was real a real question about what would be included in Biden's American Rescue Plan. And they didn't know kind of, we didn't know how expansive or how much of the child tax credit and earned income tax credit would be in that plan. And I really credit it to her and, and Senator Brown to getting those provisions in kind of the White House's preliminary kind of plan, which then allowed that to then be put as it, it got drafted into to legislation to really not give up and say, we are having, we're not cutting back on this. We're going to have the whole, all of the expansions, the larger credit, we're going to keep that in there. The full refundability, we're going to keep that in there. And so she's just been, um, she, yeah, she's just a fierce advocate. Um, and in the lobbying, in the way that I like to think FCNL folks um, um, lobby, yeah, completely. I just, I love the term you said that she's a force. and She truly is a force. Um, one of the events that we had here in Washington was a 12 hour vigil that uh, Amelia and Abby and uh, FCNL helped organize with our partners at Bread for the World and at Network Lobby um, and a whole lot of other uh, organizations. And we had a, a press conference in the middle of the day in the House Triangle over on the Capitol grounds. And um, I was honored to be able to moderate it and, and it was great to have, I think we had like six or seven members at that press conference. And then we had members show up for other parts of the 12 hour vigil to speak at it, which was, which was really terrific. But Congresswoman Deloro came and, you know, she just, she just is a, she just will not stop talking about this. And, and, you know, whether it's a press conference or whether it's to the president, you know, or whether it's to constituents or her colleagues, she is relentless. It's a great word for her. So sorry, I've got an ambulance going by here. Um, but I want to say I want to say another uh, story about Congresswoman Deloro. So when I when I was in Connecticut, I was uh, I, many of you know that I was an advocate for affordable housing and supportive housing. And um, Congresswoman Deloro's district, uh, which includes New Haven, and that's where she's from. Of course, there's there's some wealth in New Haven. We have Yale situated there. There's also a lot of poverty in in New Haven, and there are some poor communities around there. And she really understood the, the absolute need to address housing issues as well as uh, childcare issues and as well as um, the need for family support. So she would show up consistently. She would uh, fight for the resources uh, for her district and for the state of Connecticut to get the support needed um, to, to lift all families and not, not only those who are wealthy. And so she's, she's been a real stalwart, um, comes from a a political family and just, I mean, it's great, you know, if you ever go back and read history of politicians, you'd read about her mother who was a, who was a force of nature herself. And um, she was pretty compelling. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time. I'm just going to tell one brief little story. Um, so this week um, I got to go to the uh, uh, bill signing of the infrastructure bill uh, at the White House, which was an amazing opportunity. But one of the amazing things about it was I was sitting in the back there and somebody comes and sits down beside me and uh, said, oh, this is where former members of Congress sit. And I said, oh, who are you? So he took off his mask and it was Senator Chris Dodd. So if you know Connecticut politics, Senator Chris Dodd was senator for 28 years. Senator Chris Dodd actually introduced the Family and Medical Leave Act in 1993 and was one of the champions of getting that unpaid Family and Medical Leave Act passed um, many years ago in the 90s. Um, but the interesting part about Rosa DeLauro is that Rosa DeLauro worked for Chris Dodd. She was his chief of staff, not in 1993 when this passed, but before that, um, she was chief of staff. And so there's been this long uh, history of support from some of our Connecticut lawmakers. And interestingly, now Representative DeLauro is one of the key champions to get paid family and medical leave uh, included in the Build Back Better legislation. So um, okay, think of that. That was 1993, you know, decades, decades of commitment, tenacity, and um, uh, talking about why this justice award or why this justice issue is so critical to families in our country. And so for that reason, I am really thrilled that FCNL is prevent presenting the justice award to Representative DeLauro. And when you see the video, you're going to hear why we are so excited about it. Um, Amelia, any last words before we finish the session? Because I know we need to kind of wrap this up and get on to the next session. No, no, you said it all. Yeah. <laughs>
All right. Well, we have another champion for justice working with us, and that's Amelia Keegan. As you know, you can hear it in her passion, in her remarks that she shared earlier in the last session. And we are so grateful to have Amelia on FCNL's team. We're so grateful for all of you to be on this team of advocates who are going to be going into congressional offices in the next few days and or the next day and tomorrow. And um, you're going to now get more passion from uh, getting some training uh, with Jim and Larissa and hear a little bit more specifics. And please join us again uh, for questions if you have them later. And thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for uh, your advocacy on this. You will make a difference. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Amelia. That was just uh, a lot of information I didn't know about Rosa Delora. So, and and I am just so grateful to FCNL for creating this other category of award. Just so so important for us. As Diane said, we're going to transition now to uh, do the work that. Uh, that you all are going to do as you get ready to prepare for your lobby visits. I said a little while ago, I hope you took notes. So I've got my pen. I took a whole bunch of notes. I hope that you all also took notes from Amelia's presentation, because now with, with the background that we've gotten from Amelia and Diane, with the information we have, the next part of the programming is really preparing for your lobby visits. As, as we've said repeatedly, right place, right time with the right request. But how do we translate this into a lobby visit? What do you actually say? We know from, I know, 200 lobby visits um, coming. And so in the next session, we'll be able to come back to that. So uh, in, the, in this session now, uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about meeting with members of Congress in 40 states that you're going to be doing. Uh, Justin, who, who I've talked to about these lobby visits, says that uh, when he's been in touch with these offices, they are telling him that they're excited to meet with you. In fact, we've had members of Congress and their staff who've said, oh, I can't meet on that day, but I want to meet with you anyway. Can't you make a special change for us? And we're saying, no, we need you to all meet on the same day. So the task now is whether it's your first lobby visit or the hundredth time that you've been lobbying with FCNL, I hope you'll stay with us and join with other folks in your state to plan the details of your visit. We found that this detailed planning is key to ensuring the impact of your lobby visits tomorrow. Several people asked in the chat, uh, well, is there a summary of the bill that we're lobbying for? And the answer is yes, there is a summary. We've created a one-page legislative ask on the importance of the legislation to support children and families. It summarizes a lot of what Amelia just went over in great depth. You can also use it as a reference and then email it to your congressional office after you've spoken to them. I know that uh, we're also going to post in the chat how you can find this document online. You can go to fcnl.org slash qppi. Again, that's fcnl.org slash qppi. But as we get into this session, and that's why I'm so glad that Larissa is with us, I, I want to just remind us that members of Congress and their staff are faced with numbers, policy briefings, and statistics on a daily basis. Meeting with people who live in their districts and states stands out because they can connect those statistics in a way that briefings can't. What are you seeing in your community? And what are you feeling? That's what could be as important or more important than the details of the legislation or the arguments about the policy. According to a study done by the Congressional Management Foundation, explaining why you care about an issue in a lobby visit has the most potential to influence members of Congress. More potential than writing letters or even calling the office or leaving a message. We are reminding them of the people, not just the numbers. Although the numbers, as we heard from Amelia, the numbers impacted by this legislation is impressive. 
at the end of the day, it is about people. Second, as constituents, we play a unique role. Members of Congress do their best to be informed about what's happening in their districts, what's happening in their states. But remember, there are people too. It is quite possible, even pretty likely, that they are not aware of the realities lived by the constituents in their state, certainly your realities. That's where we come in. Now, I, I often say, as people are preparing for lobby visits and absorbing all of the detailed information, the facts and the figures, that one of the things I try to do is I try to step back and say, for my part of the lobby visit, and obviously you want to make time for members of Congress to respond to your questions, your lobby ask, you should spend maybe 50% of the time on the policy, but really 50% of the time that you're talking should be about who you are. Where do you live? What do you do? Why do you care about this issue? And, and that's why I'm so glad that we've got Larissa with us today. I'm going to hand this over to Larissa, who has done so many of these lobby trainings and done so many lobby visits to really explain what is the importance of the story? How, how, do, we, how do we look at that, Larissa? Thank you so much, Jim. I am really excited to be here. Thanks to everyone who's tuning in and is going to be lobbying with us tomorrow. So your story is really an answer to the question, why? <laughs> it's just a one word question, a longer form. Why do you care about this issue? So if you're telling a member of Congress, we need to extend these tax credit expansions, why? Why do you care so much about that issue? It's clear that we are all here, we're all tuned into this conference, we're all gonna lobby tomorrow because we care to some degree, of course, about Congress taking action to make sure that these benefits for children and families don't expire. But why are we so committed? The answer to this question might not come to you right away. So we do have three examples of stories that will help guide you, hopefully, in forming your own. Now, like Jim was saying, we hold a unique role in this process. And these stories are a power that only we as constituents can bring into an office. That doesn't mean that these stories are long. That doesn't mean that they have to be extensive. Each story should actually be about two minutes or less. In a lobby visit that might only last 15 or 20 minutes total, it's really important to leave time for asking questions, answering questions, getting everything out that you wanted to, everyone who wants to tell a story is able to. So the first story that we're going to hear is from Pam Ferguson. And she is talking in this story about her experience at a food pantry in Winchester, Indiana. Now, before we listen, I want to point out that she will talk about the value of caring for others, for her neighbors, and for vulnerable children and families. A story about values or about faith is powerful. You don't need to have direct experience with an issue to care about it. So as you listen, think about what values have led you to push against hunger and poverty. Hi, my name is Pam Ferguson, and I'm a Quaker from rural Indiana. Ten years ago, I began managing a food pantry that was supported by all the faith communities in our small town. I've spent most of my adult life working on poverty and hunger issues in Africa and here in the United States, and becoming involved in the local food pantry um, seemed the right thing to do to make my advocacy visible on a daily basis. Over the last 10 years, We've served an average of 4,000 households per year with the goal of increasing nutritious fresh food and the number of pounds per person. It, it has worked and we're really thankful. Few of us has, were prepared for COVID in 2020, in March of 2020. The first week our pantry was flooded with people who needed food for the lockdown. After the initial surge, another thing happened that we were not prepared for. Many of you saw the endless lines of cars waiting for free food in urban areas, but in rural Indiana, we discovered the impact of increased SNAP benefits, extra stimulus money, and the tax child, the child tax credit um, on 
um, rural poverty stricken area. Only 3% of our neighbors lost their employment during this pandemic. So most of the neighbors who use the pantry are what we call underemployed. Their wages are one or two or three, uh, for one or two or three jobs were not enough to sustain their family. And our pantry helped during those difficult times. And only about 70% of them use the pantry once or twice a year. Before the pandemic, we had 350 households per month. With the extra government help over the past 18 months, our household count per month has averaged 120. This means that our county of 25,000 people, we have less people falling through the cracks. Our local community has been able to sustain two grocery stores. And this money is staying in our community and helping more than just those who receive the help. Over the past two months, we're starting to see and experience a 25% increase in household visits. We expect this number to increase unless we as a faith community and as a government make protecting vulnerable children and families a priority in how we spend our tax dollars. Please do not cut out my neighbors in Randolph County, Indiana, as you consider legislation to extend the income earned income tax credit and the child tax credit expansions. That means great a great amount of um, help to us here in Randolph County, Indiana. Thank you. Thank you so much to Pam for sharing that story with us. And notice that she did a little more than tell her story, right? She also introduced herself at the beginning, gave some quick context into her connection to Winchester, and then ended by saying the ask. These are important details to remember when it is your turn to tell a story during the lobby visit. Not only do we want them to know what the ask is, but we also want to make sure that you're establishing that connection with the office. They don't know you, so take a moment to do that. Now, the second story that we'll hear is from Alicia McBride. And it is about how the child tax credit had a direct impact on her family. Stories of impact can be powerful as they demonstrate just how our policy ask will help constituents. My name is Alicia McBride and I live in Tacoma Park, Maryland. The financial downturn in 2018 and 2019 was really hard for my family and our income took a big hit. We had a baby and a toddler and we needed to keep them in daycare to avoid losing even more of our income. And daycare, especially in the DC area, is hugely expensive. We were paying more for daycare than we were for rent. And the result of that situation is that we got into some debt. And over the next 12 or 13 years, you know, our financial situation has improved a lot. But even so, paying down that debt has been challenging. There are always new expenses related to children, as wonderful as they are, even now that they are in middle and high school. But it's been an ongoing source of stress, logging into that account and seeing that big number sitting there and never really getting any smaller. But then over the summer, we started getting these monthly child tax credit payments and it's made such a difference. We're starting to pay down that debt finally and even put some more money towards the kids' college savings. Even this relative small increase in our income has made a huge difference for my family, both financially and in our stress level around money. And I also know that we are relatively privileged, both in our income bracket and our access to family support and wealth. And that's why I want my members of Congress to extend the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit expansions. It's helped me, and I know it's even more vital for families and children with fewer resources than mine. Expanding the child tax credit could cut child poverty by 40%. I hope my members of Congress will support these expansions. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, for sharing that story with us. Now, Alicia um, not only talked about her own experience, but she also touched on something that many people can relate to, that raising children is expensive. And in the recession that we just went through, the uncertainty made most families wonder how they were going to manage. 
Now, before moving on to that last story, I want to quickly say that you should never share what you are not comfortable sharing. Different people approach this issue with different lived experiences, and stories of direct impact can feel really personal. You should never feel pressure to tell a story that you don't feel comfortable telling. I also want to say that you should not share someone else's story and experience unless you have asked permission from them to do so. So finally, we're going to hear from Sarah. Now, Sarah is going to speak directly about the pandemic. Many uh, stories have already touched on this and how many people, including those in her community, struggled to support their families in the last year and a half. Now, there is a sense of urgency to this story. The global pandemic has clearly made things worse for families that were already struggling. My name is Sarah Freeman Wolpert, and I live in Baltimore, Maryland. I want to share a story about why the issue of economic justice is so urgent for families right now as we're living through an unprecedented global pandemic. The past year and a half have been a time of struggle and hardship for so many families around the country, including those in my own community. When the pandemic started, my neighbors created a big shared spreadsheet of things that people needed and things that people could offer for free. And we all traded phone numbers so we could support each other through such a tough time. But when I looked at that spreadsheet, I was shocked to see how many parents were reaching out, asking neighbors for food, for formula, for diapers, and for other basic necessities for their children. It really hit home for me, the urgency that parents are facing to meet the basic needs for their babies and young children, especially during this pandemic. And it was a turning point for me to realize how the issue of child hunger and poverty were so present in my own neighborhood, not just something far away. These are the people who I greet every day on the sidewalk, the people who play with my dog at the dog park, uh, the people whose children knocked on my door this year to trick or treat in their costumes. But in private, many of them are struggling to make ends meet. My community's story is just one example that shows how crucial it is for our legislators to support economic justice for parents and families, especially by extending the expansions of the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. When I think about the way all of our neighbors came together to help each other when the pandemic started, I just hope our elected officials will do the same to support our local families by taking the action that we need to make sure that the kids in my neighborhood have what they need to thrive. My name is Sarah Freeman. And thank you, Sarah, for sharing that story with us. Again, thanks to all three of our volunteers for sharing their stories. Sharing a story can feel vulnerable, so we are very grateful um, for their time and their energy. I wanna take this final moment to remind all of you that you are a group of hundreds of people attending FCNL's Quaker Public Policy Institute. That's incredible. And you don't necessarily have to mention this in your story, but saying it at least once during the lobby visit will be important. We want these offices to know just how loud our collective voice really is. Okay, well, I hope that these examples were helpful. There is no formula for telling a perfect story. I always say your story is always correct because it is your story. It's about why you care about this issue. It could be about impact. Something has happened to you or your community or a friend. Remember to ask permission if that's what you're going to do. It could be about a value that leads you to care for this issue. You want to care for others, for example. Or it could be about urgency. Many storytellers just now mentioned the global pandemic and how it has made the financial situation for many families and communities uh, much worse than it was before. Values, impact, urgency. It could be a little bit of all three. Like I said, there is no perfect way to tell a story. These examples are just meant to get you thinking about what your story is. If for some reason you're sitting there thinking that you don't have one because you definitely do. So good luck with your stories, everyone. I know you'll do great and we'll have some awesome training in just a bit um, for all of you to really get into the nitty gritty of a lobby visit. You might be wondering, when am I going to tell a story? How does this sound in a lobby visit? 
Well, I'm going to hand it over to Jim now, and he'll explain exactly what the structure of a visit is. So thanks, everybody. And thanks again, Jim. That was great, Larissa. Thank you so much. That really, I think, for those of you around the country, it starts with the story, as, as we've been telling you all along. Now, we're going to spend just a little bit of time to talk about, so how do you go through a lobby visit? Because this, this is the moment then. Again, I'm going to hold up the green program that some of you got in the mail. Did you get this program? It's got Senator Tammy Baldwin on the cover, I noticed. If you did get it out, get out a pen. If you didn't, go on over to fcnl.org slash QPPI. I think Annie is also going to post that in the chat on YouTube so that you can see that. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to talk through what actually happens when you get on that Zoom chat or I mean the Zoom uh, meeting or on the telephone meeting. What do you actually do? You'll, you will see... That one pager I mentioned earlier on the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit, or what we call the legislative ask, that's right inside the front cover of, of the green booklet, and it's at the top of the web page. Then on the web page under the leave behind and in the booklet, you'll see a sheet of paper where you can print out and write your lobby visit details. Or and actually, and, not or, you should have also gotten an electronic version of the schedule of your lobby visits that also includes some important information about your members of Congress and where they stand, and also includes uh, the other people on your lobby delegation. This will be in what they call a Google, uh, a Google Doc, I think it's what it's called. So make sure, and I'm just going to stress this over and over again. We are in lots of different time zones doing these virtual meetings. Hands down, the biggest problem with lobby visits is people don't show up at the right time at the right place. And it is more complicated now, of course. But Justin and Claire have done an, uh, just an amazing job setting this up. So when you break down, when you break up into these state groups, you'll get to see those documents again, but you should have those in your email. And then the next document is really what we call the roadmap. And, and that is what we're going to come to in a second. Following that document and on the website as well uh, is a model for the follow-up email. One person in your uh, delegation will be sending a follow-up email to the congressional staff person after you visited, reiterating the ask, talking about who was in the visit and saying, can you tell us in the next two weeks in the next seven days, what's your response to the thing you asked us for? Finally, you'll see a link to a report back form. Getting these report backs is critical to our lobbying. It's critical to our power, our Quaker power on the Hill. So that's, that's, that's the structure. I'm now going to take us through the lobby visit roadmap because this is what you're going to work on once you go into your state visits. The first page of the roadmap, and I've got my own here, so I'm going to follow along. The first page of the roadmap, I hope you've pulled those out now. I want to, if I could see you, I, oh, good, I see Larissa has got hers. So uh, the first page of the roadmap is really the, the kind of logistics. Uh, this is the page where you, you talk about the different roles during your, your, your lobby visit. So the, if, 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 if you, oh, I should said, I should have said actually, first of all, that if you don't have the information about your lobby visits, uh, then you should be in touch with Justin Hurdle or Claire Cardle, Carter. Uh, you should have already received this information from one of them, but if you did not, you can email Justin. It's J Hurdle, J H U R D L E at fcnl.org. Again, J. H-U-R-D-L-E at F-C-N-L dot O-R-G. I know Annie's going to put that in the chat. Poor Justin's going to get a lot of emails. But hopefully before you email Justin, look in your email because you should have gotten a link to a document that really explains what, you're try what we're trying to do. So on this first page, the two key roles 
uh, for any lobby visit. The first is the note taker. This is perhaps the most important person in the visit, even though it's not a speaking role. This person must take thorough notes in order to fill out that report back form uh, after the meeting, because that's what Amelia and her colleague, Abby, will be able to look through as they do follow up next week and use the information to go into congressional offices and make our advocacy even more effective. The note taker will also follow up with the office via email after the lobby visit. The other role is the role as the group leader. The group leader is the person that facilitates each visit. They are the ones that introduce the group and keep track of what step of the roadmap you are on to make sure the visit is flowing smoothly and your group is able to get through everything you practice. This is critically important because, you know, you may find that you had a half hour visit that then gets reduced to 15 minutes, or you may be on the telephone, in which case you're trying to figure out who's speaking next. And you really need to have that group leader who's going to say, okay, now we're going to turn to Larissa. Now we're going to turn to Annie to, to ask a question. So on that first page, I recommend everybody fill out the roadmap so you're all clear about the roles, even if you're not the group leader or the note taker. And then on the second page of the roadmap, you'll see the actual structure of the visit. And as you as you go through that structure, you're going to see that the group needs two or three people telling stories. These are opportunities to do just what you practice with Larissa. And and, and to model this, we've actually prepared a little video. Uh, it, and this is what it sounds like when you go through the roadmap in a video we recorded. You'll hopefully see at the end of the day, a lobby visit is just a well-organized conversation between constituents and a congressional office. Hi, everyone. My name is Larissa, and we're going to do a lobby visit role play for you all today. We want to make sure that you know exactly what a visit sounds like and looks like before you lobby your legislators. So I'm going to be the group leader during this role play, and my colleagues Jim and Sarah will be the rest of my delegation. Ursula, my other colleague, will pretend to be a congressional staffer who works for Senator Murkowski from Alaska. Now, we will be showing a lobby visit that takes place over the phone, so not on Zoom. Once the phones are up to our ears, that means we've started the role play. So here we go. One, two, three. Hi, everyone. My name is Ursula. I'm from Senator Murkowski's office. Ursula, how are you today? I'm good. Things are super busy today. We're trying to finish everything up before the end of the year. Oh, I'm sure I'm also very busy at this time of the year. We do really appreciate you still taking the time to speak with us today. My name is Larissa, and I'm joined by my friends Jim and Sarah. We're part of the Friends Committee on National Legislation's Quaker Public Policy Institute. Hundreds of attendees are lobbying their members of Congress today in support of programs that help children and families. So on this call, we have a group of about 10 people, but only three of us will be speaking. So before we get started with the meeting, uh, could you let us know how much time you have to speak with us today? Thanks for checking. With everything being so hectic, I know I scheduled 30 minutes, but something's come up. I've only got about 10 minutes today. Okay, great. Good thing that I asked then. <laughs> well, we first wanted to thank Senator Murkowski for her leadership on the Violence Against Women Act and for her work in ensuring that Alaska Native communities have access to COVID relief. We really appreciate her leadership on this important issue. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. It's a really important issue to the Senator. Well, I'm going to turn it over to my friend Sarah to let you know what we'd like to speak with you about today. Thanks, Larissa, and thank you so much, Ursula, for meeting with us today. We're all here today to ask Senator Murkowski to extend the Earned Income Tax Credit and Child Tax Credit expansions. 
This is really important to us because tens of millions of people, including lots of people in our state of Alaska, have benefited from these expansions passed in March 2021. So we're really hoping that the Senator will speak out publicly in favor of these programs and particularly the monthly cash payments to families. Thank you, Sarah. And now I'll invite my friend Jim to share his perspective on the issue. Thanks, Larissa. And thank you, Ursula, for meeting with us today. I'm from Fairbanks and came here today because of my faith and my experience. My faith leads me to believe we all have an obligation to ensure that everyone in our rich society has food to eat, shelter, and a means for a full life. I've been fortunate in my life. But I've got relatives who've struggled, lost their jobs, and literally had months when they ran out of money to feed their children. I know because I've tried to help them. Watching parents struggle to avoid losing their house, facing the stress of not having a job in an economic crisis, and having to say no to their children is heartbreaking. The child tax credit has a proven record of helping children and families. In fact, the overwhelming majority of children in the country benefit. Expanding that credit so that it is fully available to all families regardless of income seems a no-brainer to me. These provisions, I'm told, will particularly help the poorest families in our society and communities of color. And I understand that by some estimates, this expansion could cut child poverty by 40%. That's the right thing to do. And another thing, I am so sorry, Jim. These are great points, but since Ursula did mention that she only has a few minutes, I want to make sure that Sarah has the opportunity to share her story as well. Oh, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Larissa. Um, so Ursula, I really wanted to just take a minute to share a quick story about why this issue is so important to me and the people that I care about. One of my closest friends has a one-year-old daughter who was born during the pandemic. I spent several weeks helping to take care of her baby when she was just a month old. And during that time, I saw firsthand the kinds of economic pressures that parents deal with when they have a new baby or a young child, especially during the pandemic. Um, a few days before her daughter was supposed to start daycare, we found out that that facility wasn't requiring staff to get vaccinated. So her parents really had to scramble for another childcare option to try to keep her safe. Um, but they had to spend a lot more money and that stretched their budget even tighter during a difficult time. So in all of our communities, there are parents struggling every day in one way or another to provide for their families, to put food on the table, to make sure their kids can have the opportunities they need to thrive. And that's why I'm really hoping that Senator Murkowski will support an extension of the earned income tax credit and child tax credit expansions so that babies like my friend's daughter can have everything they need to grow up healthy and safe. Thank you, Sarah. And hi, this is Larissa again. I've been thinking a lot about some of my favorite memories as a child. And, you know, they included traveling to Denali for a weekend every summer. That was usually our annual family vacation. And they include the weekly pizza night that my family would have because it was such a huge treat to share two large pizzas once a week with um, the whole family. I always took these memories for granted. And I did not know that my family of four children benefited from the child tax credit. I found out later in my life that there was a time when my family lived paycheck to paycheck and the benefits that they received gave just enough assistance for my parents to not only provide us kids with the necessities, but also with some little joys. Children deserve to grow up without the worries of a harsh world and families deserve to have the resources to provide a safe, nurturing, and joyful childhood. So Ursula, I'd really love to hear from you about the Senator's position on extending the child tax credit and earned income tax credit expansions. Thanks so much for sharing these stories with me. I've been trying to take furious notes and I'll be sure to pass them along to the Senator because she really wants to know what her constituents care about. As you know, four years ago, Senator Murkowski supported an earlier expansion of the child tax credit. 
And the senator is very committed to this program. The way the Democrats are doing this with the reconciliation process is just, it's wrong. And she will not vote for that. The senator likes to work in a bipartisan manner. And she's also worried about the price tag and the impact of inflation on ordinary people. We appreciate Senator Murkowski's commitment to expanding the child tax credit and making sure the benefits are able to reach those most in need. We, of course, support the recovery package, but even if the senator cannot support the full package, we would hope she could make a statement acknowledging the importance of making the expanded benefits in the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit permanent. Could she do that? I'm not sure, but I'll check with the senator to see. Hi, Ursula. Again, this is Larissa. Um, I really can't stress enough how important this issue is for so many of our families. The child's tax credit expansions provide benefits for almost every child in America. Literally more than 80% of families with children will benefit. And the expansion particularly helps the parents of 26 million children who before March did not earn enough money to access the full child's tax credit. And these benefits will expire if Congress doesn't act. So even outside of the recovery package, do you think the senator would be supportive of extending these benefits as a policy measure? As I said, we are supportive of these measures, but Republicans are not in the majority in the Senate. Um, it's the, Rep Re the Democrats who set the agenda, and right now they're rejecting bipartisan approaches to solve this problem and approaching this issue with a, in a partisan manner, uh, which is just in contrast to the bipartisan infrastructure package, which the senator does support, and which has the support of Democrats, Republicans, and independents. Okay, well, I know that you're going to have to go soon, and we're, we're almost uh, through. I do believe that Sarah has one more point to share. Thanks, Larissa. So I just wanted to, to reiterate and to emphasize that we're really hoping the senator could at least make public statements calling for the extension of these benefits. As we've said on this call, the Earned Income Tax Credit and the Child Tax Credit are two of the most important anti-poverty programs in the country. They reduce racial disparities, and historically, they've had bipartisan support. So this is an issue of protecting our most vulnerable, especially in Alaska, um, and I hope that the senator could provide that support. Thank you, Sarah. I'll raise it with the senator. Well, I'll repeat what everyone else has said. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us, Ursula. Sarah is going to send you a follow-up email, and we really hope to hear back from you uh, what the senator is able to do in support of this issue. Thank you all so much, and have a great day. Bye. Thanks, Ursula. Thank you. All right, so that's a lobby visit. That's what it's going to sound like when you lobby your legislators. Remember that this was a lobby visit done over the phone. Not all of you will be over the phone. Some of you will be on Zoom. And if you are on Zoom, then you'll be able to see each other, unlike you will be over the phone. So make sure that you're sitting in a place that doesn't have too many distractions. Make sure you're not snacking on anything. Make sure you're paying attention and putting in the time and energy that the lobby visit requires. So what are some things that went well? And what are some things that we could have done a little better? Notice that we repeated the ask multiple times. So at the beginning, we made it very clear what we were asking the senator to do. In the middle, we stated it again, and we ended the lobby visit saying it one more time. I'm sure we said it more than three times during the visit. You want to be really clear what you're asking the office to do. So you can never repeat the ask too many times. What is something that we could have done a little bit better? Remember, we were on the phone. So even though you could see us, we couldn't see each other in this scenario. We weren't really introducing ourselves every single time we spoke. So there were some moments where I said, 
I did not say, hi, this is Larissa again, or Jim did not say, hi, this is Jim again. Remember to always say who you are so that they know whose voice is actually on the call in that moment. I'm sure you'll all do great. We are so excited to have so many of you taking action with us on this important issue. You know where to find us if you have any questions. We are really, really, really grateful for your advocacy and for the time and energy that you've put into this work. Good luck, everybody. Thanks, Larissa, for being the delegation leader for that video. That was just uh, really fabulous. Uh, the one thing that uh, Justin wanted me to just restress again is as they've scheduled these lobby visits, uh, they're, they're getting visits that probably are just going to be 15 to 20 minutes. So you do really have to have a pretty tight structure in order to do what you want to do. But we've got a couple of minutes before the end of this section of the program and before we get you into your state visits. So Annie, let's bring Annie up and see if we're hearing anything from YouTube Central. What kind of questions are you getting, Annie? Yeah, we have one or two questions if we have time. But the first question is, um, what, okay, so folks know what their lobby schedule is for tomorrow, but where do they get the information on the legislature's position on the tax credit? Yeah, so my recommendation, which is the recommendation we gave to staff as we were preparing for this conference, is to look at the American Rescue Plan that was passed in March of 2021. If your legislator voted yeah, yes, voted for the American Rescue Plan, then it's likely that they will continue to support the um, uh the expansions of the child tax credit and the earned income tax credit, because that is where we saw those expansions take place. And we want to make sure that they continue. Um, and that is our ask. So I would check out the American Rescue Plan and what stance your legislators took on that. Got some more questions there for us, Anna? Yes. So there's one question that I will quickly answer, which is, is that are these helpful videos available for review, which they absolutely are. They're at fcnl.org slash qppi we have them all there so you can continue to review them tonight if you want to get uh extra super duper prepared for your visits tomorrow and then you know there was one question i thought was good um that we touched upon in a couple of sessions ago with amelia what do you do with certain republican pushback but for those offices just to reiterate again for those offices that say that they're already supportive and that's sort of the pushback that you're getting of well we already support it we've done what we can um, can you just say a little bit about what an answer to that could be sure yeah so i was gonna say uh jim do you want to take it or should i go ahead larissa okay so i'll start and you jump in um I really like to say, and I know Jim likes to say this as well, it is not over until it's over. So until we have actually seen this pass through, uh, you know, President Biden's desk and signed and it is official, negotiations will continue to take place and changes could still happen. So we want to make sure that if someone says they're already supportive, that they are vocal about that. Um, publicly, or they're talking to their colleagues, making sure that um, others are also supportive and making sure that they are prioritizing keeping these expansions in the final version of this bill. So Jim, do you want to add anything to that? No, we're, I think that was a perfect answer. Uh, maybe Annie, I don't know if you have anything more right now, because we're getting a little short on time. So I, I think we're going to wrap it up now. The two things I'll stress is one, that we will have office hours. Amelia and Abby will be available to answer your questions along with Justin, and I'll be there. We'll have a couple of other people. So if you don't have every fact that you need for this lobby visit, drop on into those office hours. But the most important thing that you're going to do today is at 3.30 Eastern time today, we need you to go to a Zoom meeting for the people in your state. And this is where you are gonna work through exactly the kind of lobby visit that we just planned. You're gonna practice a lobby visit. And if you're like me, you're gonna make mistakes, but those mistakes are a great way to learn what's needed. So we'll have FCNL staff in those Zoom meetings. You can find those Zoom meetings, as it says on the slide, by going to fcnl.org slash am schedule. 
Again, fcnl.org slash AM schedule. And that is East Coast on the, I mean, 3 p.m. on the, uh, 3.30 p.m. on the East Coast, 12.30 in California, 11.30 for those of you in Alaska, and 10.30 for those of you in Hawaii. Wow, this is giving me a math challenge here. Uh, in our experience, these sessions are the most important sessions of the day. So you've got, I think, just about a half hour to get ready, to get your pieces of paper, to take a little walk, but do be back there because it's really important that we figure out who's doing which roles there. So thank you all. Great to be with you. Look forward to seeing you all uh, later this afternoon in my state visit, but then also uh, at the office hours, and then we'll be back tomorrow morning. So just a reminder that members of Congress and their staff want to meet with constituents. They want to know what moves you, what moves your heart. So whatever happens in your practice, just don't worry too much about it. Bring your heart, your values, your experience into those lobby visits. And I am absolutely sure that they will work out well. See you in half an hour.